This happened about a year ago. From 2013 to 2015, I worked night shift security at an RV resort. I was on my way to work one night when my front driver side tire blew out on a long narrow dirt road. It was around 10.30pm, so it was pretty dark. I live in a very secluded area in upstate Florida, and this road wasn't near any neighborhoods and had only a few streetlights. My shift started at 11, so I called up the manager and told her I might be a little bit late because I had to change the tire. After I got that squared away, I pulled out my car jack and started to position it underneath my ranger. I was about to start cranking away when I saw the dim glow of some golf cart headlights approaching me from down the street in the direction I had just come from. I was thinking that it was probably a local wondering what was going on and maybe they would be nice enough to give me a hand. The golf cart stopped behind my truck. I stood up from where I was crouching and said, Hey there, one of my tires just blew out. You wouldn't mind giving me a hand, would you? I'm kinda running late for work. The person in the golf cart didn't respond, and then I heard them exiting the golf cart. The person came within the headlights of their own golf cart. The light was so dim, it was kind of hard to see, but he looked like a middle-aged man with no shirt on, so I could clearly see his beer gut. I could also make out that he had hairy legs, and I could see that something was dangling under his massive stomach. Turns out, he was completely naked. That's something I could have lived my entire life without seeing, but the man seemed to be holding something in his hands. I only caught a quick look at the object, but I could tell that the thing this man was holding looked like a machete. The man didn't say a word as he started to slowly walk towards me. I quickly jumped back into my truck, started her up, and noped the fuck out of there. I didn't have time to grab my car jack, so I just left it behind. My truck was lopsided from the deflated tire, and it awkwardly excelled forward. I could see in my interior mirror that the headlights of the golf cart were close behind me. Despite my truck having a flat tire, it was still going a decent speed, but so was the golf cart that was tailing me. So, in a split second decision, I slammed the brakes of my Ranger, and not even a second later, I heard and felt the golf cart smash into my rear end. I rolled down my window and shouted, Fuck you, creep and I sped off into the night. I managed to get to work on time. I fucked up my rim pretty bad though. I explained everything to the manager, and the cops were called. They searched the roads, but found no signs of the guy or his golf cart. But they did find my car jack, which was returned to me. Other than a few minor dents, the back of my truck didn't look too bad at all. I'm sure that the golf cart had it ten times worse. He had to be going full speed when it crashed into me. I'm surprised he was able to drive away after that. I've come to the conclusion that this weirdo must have been on a serious meth high, because that area has that kind of reputation. I no longer own that truck or work at that site anymore. So, bare arse, overweight, machete-wielding psychopath, for the love of God, put on some fucking pants. This is a story given to me by a friend of mine. He's a psychiatrist in Tokyo, and has helped, or at least tried to help, a lot of truly disturbed people. We were at a school reunion when he told me about a case he was working on. His subject was a woman who had recently been charged with assault. She was locked up, and it was my friend's job to analyse her mental condition. I think he only told me because we're really close friends, and because he was very, very drunk. I won't be revealing any names or anything, you know, confidentiality and whatnot, but he didn't technically say to me that I shouldn't tell the story to anyone either. Maybe it's because it's rather unbelievable. 
Honestly, I didn't really believe it either, but I asked him about it again when he was sober, and he confirmed that everything he said was true. Now, I've known this guy for 30 years, and he's never lied to me before, even when we've both been intoxicated out of our minds. But I asked for some written proof, which he actually provided me. This story comes from a written account that the woman made. She was either unable or unwilling to talk at the time, so had to write down her side of the story. It's highly unethical, but regardless, I've transcribed as much as I could, as best as I could, here. What? In that instant, I was stunned. I couldn't understand what he was saying. Break up? What did he mean, break up? I'd devoted the last few years of my life entirely to him. But why, I asked him. You're too heavy. Heavy? What do you mean by heavy? That I'm fat? I asked him. No, you're not fat. I mean, you're emotionally heavy. You're a mental burden. A mental burden? Everything I did with my time was for him. My cooking, my money, all of it was for him. How could that be a mental burden on him? I don't know how to say it. You're so clingy, so overprotective. You don't let me do anything myself. Sometimes I think you'd wipe my ass for me if I asked you to. What's wrong with that, Doctor? So many people would dream to have someone like that in their lives. A second mother. Someone who will always look out for them and provide them their every need. It was all for him. Everything was for him. I'm sorry, darling. I cried. I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. Please! All right, then. Get out of my sight. What? Then get out of my sight, as fast as possible. I was astounded. Is that what he wanted? I'd do anything to grant his wish, but then I wouldn't be able to see him ever again. No, no, that can't happen. I don't want that to happen, I thought to myself. I couldn't bear it anymore, and ran out of his room, crying. I sat outside in the park, swinging aimlessly on the swing set. I'm not very smart, but I racked my brain as hard as I could to work out how I could avoid the breakup. The best thing to do would be respect his wishes, but that would mean I'd have to leave him. That just couldn't happen. So, after some deep thinking, I came up with an idea. This was the only solution. No time like the present. I went to the local convenience store to buy what I needed. When I pressed the buzzer to his apartment, he almost immediately opened the door for me. Oh. What do you want? He asked. I want to make it up with you. I told you to stay out of my sight, he bellowed at me. I know. I'll fulfill your wish. I'd do anything for you. And with that, I quickly drew the screwdriver out of my pocket and plunged it into his right eye. At that point, he was rolling on the floor with agony. The poor little thing. I didn't want him to suffer for too long. It was easier the second time. He was on the floor after all. I perched on top of him and brought down the screwdriver again. It narrowly missed his left eye and slid into his left cheek, but it wasn't too difficult to slide the tool along his face and into the socket. Squelch is the sound I think it made. A cute sound, just like him. So, that's her account. Not all of it. Quite a lot of it was uninterpretable, according to my friend. Difficult to believe, right? Like I said, I didn't really believe him either. Not until I read this, at least. Then again, the fact he showed me this doesn't mean it's 100% true, either. This could have just been the ramblings of an imaginative but insane woman. But like I said... My friend's not much of a liar. Either way, I can kind of see her logic. 
the man asked her to get out of his sight. And technically, I suppose she did. In March of 2003, back when I was 17 years old, my younger brother and I took a weekend camping trip up to Los Padres National Forest. We'd gone there many times with our family for day camping, swimming, and just lounging around. This time though, we went alone for a two-night camping trip at our favourite spot. It's a place that most locals simply refer to as the Gorge. We'll never forget that weekend, but for all the wrong reasons. We got there Saturday morning at around 9am and hiked the five miles out to the gorge. The gorge is a large swimming hall with a huge 60 foot rock cliff boulder that visitors love to jump from into the deep water below. The jumping rock cliff is very steep and you have to jump in a very specific location to ensure that you don't hit the rocks protruding from the wall face. The gorge has many primitive camping areas and is overall a beautiful yet isolated place. The first day was very fun, and after a long day of swimming, catching crawdads, jumping from rocks, and just relaxing, we set up our tent, made a fire, and ate our cans of spaghettios and a few crawdads we had cooked for dinner. Towards the end of our dinner, we were visited by a large group of students who were camping farther down the river. They stated that they were students from the Bay Area, and had a few nights left in their almost two week long school camping trip. We offered them some of our chips and snacks, and chatted with them for a bit before they made their hike back to their camping spot. It soon got dark, and my brother and I got ready for bed. My brother was two years younger than me, and had a deep fear of isolation. So we slept in the same tent, and agreed that we'd keep our fire burning the entire night to ease his anxieties. We put five large logs on the fire, and crept inside our tent and got in our sleeping bags. We both fell asleep very fast, as we were exhausted from the day. Around 2.30 in the morning, we are both awoken by a large splash of water near our tent that puts out our fire. We heard no voices, and couldn't see much from inside our tent. We froze in terror. My brother began to cry, and I tried to calm him down. I told him I'd go outside and investigate, and that everything would be okay said our water bladder must have fallen from the tree where it was hung, and that I'm sure it's some kind of coincidence. I grabbed my flashlight, unzipped our tent, and stepped outside. I pointed the flashlight over to the fire pit, and saw four large men sitting around our fireplace, all staring at me with what I can only describe as expressionless faces. It appeared as though they had slit open our two-gallon water bladder and tossed it into our fire. I was in shock and didn't know what to say. For about five seconds, none of them said anything. We just stared at each other. Then, in a very drunk voice, one of them said, Get your pussy friend out here too. I then heard my brother hyperventilating and screaming and crying in our tent in a way that made me feel so helpless. I had no weapons, and my brother and I were outnumbered two to one. I asked the men what they wanted, and told them that we could just leave, and that we were sorry if we were taking their camping spot or invading their area. They ignored my questions, and just stood up. That's when I see that two of the four men were holding something in their hands. They were long, sword-shaped in appearance, like a machete or a short sword, but they looked homemade, primitive. The men yelled at us to get up and to bring our pussy asses with them. I thought for a second that these might be drunken rangers, merely mad at us for having too big of a fire, but once I glanced at their clothing and saw their baggy jeans and their black and grey hoodies, I knew we weren't so lucky. I had heard in the past that drug dealers and Mexican cartels had been caught hiding their marijuana plants in the forest, and wondered if these men were of a similar breed, and somehow felt like we were a threat to their crops. We were in fear for our lives. The men didn't touch us or directly threaten us with violence, but the threat was definitely implied in their tone, and I knew we didn't have any choice in the matter. We followed the lead male while the other three men fell back behind us. My brother put his hand on my shoulder 
and was visibly shaking. He then whispered to me that they were walking us in the direction of the 60-foot rock cliff, and that we needed to run. I was petrified, and hadn't been paying attention to where they were leading us, but when he said it, I realized he was right. I stopped dead in my tracks, and said to the men, What are you gonna do to us? The lead male said in a very slurred voice, Nothing. We're just gonna have some fun with you pussies. I felt like we really had no choice but to do what they said, and hope that they were merely screwing with us, and that this would all be over soon. After about 30 seconds of walking, we arrived at the jumping spot on top of the boulder, overlooking the gorge swimming area. One of the men then asked, Have you guys ever jumped from here? I told them yes, I had, but my brother hadn't, as it was a pretty high jump, and was very dangerous for most people due to the height of the rocks below. The men laughed, and again called my brother a pussy. I told them we weren't pussies, but it just wasn't safe to do it in the dark. The men then formed a half circle around us, and one of them said, I wanna see, show us you're not a bunch of pussies. I screamed at them that it was too dangerous at night, and that during the day it was dangerous enough. I told them that there are many rocks down there that you have to avoid, and that if you don't jump precisely correctly, the jump will kill you. I pleaded and pleaded. The men just laughed and took a few steps closer to us. I was beyond scared, and could hear my heart beating through my ears. My brother, by this point, was crying loudly and saying things I couldn't understand. He was beyond terrified, and so was I. I grabbed his hand and told him that we needed to get away from these men, and that we were in great danger. I told him I had jumped off the boulders into the water before, and knew where to jump, and that if he jumped with me, we'd be okay. I told him I'd use my flashlight to help guide us, and that I'd tell him where to put his feet and how far to jump. The men continued to laugh as we had our conversation, and showed zero humanity or pity. I held my brother's hand, and placed his feet onto a specific spot on the rock ledge, where I remembered jumping from last time I was there months before. I explained to him that I knew he was scared, and so was I, but that we needed to jump out as far as we possibly could, and slightly to the right, otherwise we'd hit the rocks. He was shaking crying, and kept telling me that he couldn't do it. He then urinated on the floor. The men laughed and laughed, and continued to berate us. I then told my brother we needed to jump now, and that he'd be okay if he listened to me. I told him that after we jumped, we'd swim to the shore on the right, and would hide in the bushes until daybreak, and go for help then. I then grabbed his hand tightly, and told him that once we hit the water, he needed to tuck his legs and arms in, so that they wouldn't get hurt from the impact of the water. I then instructed him that he needed to swim hard to the surface, as we'd sink pretty far down due to the height of the jump. I grabbed his hand, and we jumped. I pulled him hard with me to ensure that he'd be safe from the rocks below. We fell for what felt like a minute, but in reality was only a few seconds. My brother yelled all the way down in a way I've never heard another human being scream before. Terror, dread, and fear of imminent death reverberated from his voice. I felt helpless, and almost forgot where we were for those few seconds. Then we hit the water. As soon as we hit, I lost my grip on my brother's hand, but I did hear a second impact in the water. I swam up towards the surface with all of my energy and took a deep breath. I then listened for my brother to surface, and heard nothing. I panicked and dove down into the water to try and grab him. Just as I dove, I felt his leg brush against my hand and realized he was about to surface. I swam up again and heard my brother. He was crying, and kept saying that his arm had hit a rock on the way down, and that he couldn't feel it. The men above were laughing again, and I heard one of them say, They actually fucking made it. Those pussies. 
I then heard objects splashing in the water around us, and realised that they were throwing beer bottles, or rocks, or some other hard objects at us. I quickly grabbed my brother by his shirt, and helped him swim to the nearby shore. The whole time we swam, tons of objects landed dangerously close to us, and I remember thinking, if any of these hit us on the head, it's gonna kill us. I had lost my flashlight during the fall, and we were in complete darkness. We reached the water's edge, and I pulled my brother to the shore. Objects continued to rain down around us, and we could hear the men yelling and laughing. I had told my brother that we needed to run. He was crying, and he was holding his injured arm, which he still couldn't feel or use. It had a deep cut around the elbow, and even with just the starlight, we could see it was a serious injury. We stumbled down the tree line, and began making our way through the darkness to one of the main trails, using only my memory as a guide. We fell again and again, and were cut by branches and rocks all over our bodies as we wandered about down the overgrown trail. Everything in my body told me to keep going, and to get as far away from these men as we could. We walked for many minutes until we could no longer hear the men, and then we waited. I wrapped my brother's arm with my shirt, and told him it was all over, and that all we had to do now was wait until morning for help. We sat in that spot all night, and my brother cried and shook for hours. I just put my arm around him and patted his head, just like when we were children and he had a panic attack and our parents weren't around. At daybreak, we finally see the severity of his injuries. He had a deep gash in his arm, and his shoulder was obviously dislocated. I helped him hike up the nearby trail, and we walked all the way back to the base camp ranger station. We explained what had happened to the rangers, and they sent two armed officers to go and investigate the location. My brother was sent to a nearby hospital for treatment, and I joined him in the ambulance ride over. The rangers never found the men, but did retrieve most of our gear. The scary thing about this incident is that same week, two teenage boys were found dead at the bottom of the gorge jumping area. They had been a part of the school trip group we had met earlier. Their camping ground had been invaded by a group of people with similar machete-like objects who chased them off their camping spot. I'm glad to be alive, and my brother and I have never gone camping alone again, nor have we been back to the gorge. All we have left from the incident are the scars on my brother's arm, hospital bills, and a lot of trauma. An article about the death of the two teenage boys can be found in the description below. I can only hope that their deaths were accidents like the authorities ruled. I didn't find out about their deaths until seven years later, but was horrified by the similar circumstances and the timing of the two events. When I was about seven or eight years old, there was this creek in the middle of a forest behind my house that I used to play at all the time. One side of the creek was bordered by a dirt wall about five feet high. I used to jump over the creek from one side to the other, and it was fun to pretend I knew parkour. Then, one day, I went out to the creek, and lying in the middle of it was a brand new football. Now, I want to mention an important detail. The creek's depth made it so that the top half of the football stuck out of the water. The top half was completely dry, so it wasn't like the ball was just rolled into the creek. It was placed there. Written on the top of the football in black permanent marker were the words, Johnny Jumps. And underneath that phrase was a phone number. Now, this is weird, because my name is Johnny. I picked up the football and went home, obviously very confused and kind of scared. Whoever put that ball there had been watching me. They placed it directly where I would jump over the creek when I played by myself. I grabbed the cordless phone, and I called the number. It was the number to Homeland Security. Yeah, fucking Homeland Security. 
the fucking number you call when you think a terrorist attack is about to go down. It was basically Super 911, especially seeing as this was only a few years after 9-11. I quickly tried to explain my situation to the lady on the phone, and she told me it was okay, and to not call the number again. I instantly ran and told my mum what had just happened, and she was just as confused as I was. My parents are divorced, but when my dad came over later that evening to drop something off, I told him what happened as well. He asked me to give him the football, and he said he was going to look into it. I gave it to him, and he left a few minutes later. I kept asking him if he ever figured anything out, and he would give me vague answers, or try and dodge the question altogether. This turned into a few weeks of me asking, which then turned into a few months. Then, he started acting like he didn't know what I was talking about. That was about ten years ago, and if I ask him about it now, he says that he has zero memory of this ever happening. He doesn't remember the football at all. My mum does, but only vaguely. To this day, I have absolutely zero idea who was watching me, why they put the football in the creek, why they wrote Johnny Jumps on it, and I especially have no fucking idea why they put the number to Homeland Security on the ball. I never really thought too much about this incident until I was older, when I realised how fucking creepy this whole thing was. I continued to live by that creek for a few more years, and continued to play and jump over the creek until I moved away. There were no teenagers in my neighbourhood. I was the oldest kid. All of my neighbours were very friendly, and I knew them all personally. None of them were ever creepy to me and nothing else strange ever happened in the 12 years I lived there. This is the scariest episode from my childhood. It took place in 1991, when I was 8 years old. I lived in a village on the Norwegian countryside, with my parents and two older brothers. There weren't many kids around for us to play with, so we always stuck together, despite the age gaps. I was eight, and my brothers were ten and twelve. It was a safe neighbourhood, and we were outdoorsy kids. It was fine for us to just return home to eat and then go back out and play in the woods or go fishing in the nearby lake. In the autumn of 1991, my oldest brother dared us to sneak into an abandoned property that was located nearby. We had always thought of it as a haunted house, but really it was just an old house where the man who started the village brick factory once lived. No one had lived there for ages, and the paint was starting to peel off, and several windows were broken. Our parents would tell us to never go there. Their reason was of course that they feared we would get hurt playing there, but we thought it was because it was haunted. But that day, we dared to walk around in the garden. It had a now dried up pond, an old well, several old and dying fruit trees, and even tools in an old shed. It looked as if someone had just walked out one day and never bothered to return, leaving everything as it was. We soon came to think of the garden as our own, and played there all the time. We climbed the trees, used the tools to build things, and generally had a great time. Our very own secret playground. We suspected that people in the village had seen us, because soon our parents would ask us if we had gone there despite being strictly forbidden, which of course we denied, but someone must have complained. This incident happened one day in November. I remember as it was the day before my birthday. It was a damp and rainy day, and we weren't really in the mood for playing outside, but our mum had chased us out of the house so she could clean in peace and we weren't allowed back until an hour later. So, we decided to try and open the old cellar in the abandoned house. I'm not sure what the word is in English, but imagine, if you will, a hatch that opens almost horizontally to the ground, then a few steps that lead you down into a digged out cellar with stone walls and earth floor. It was used to store vegetables and such, but now was empty. All of us climbed down to have a look, the plan was to write our names on the inside of the cellar, 
sort of to make it as our own kind of thing. Suddenly, the hatch is slammed shut above us, and the cellar became completely dark. I started screaming, and my older brothers try and open the hatch. When my oldest brother, Sindre, pushed the hatch open, he saw a man's hand holding an axe. Come on out, you trespassing little brats. Sindre shouted back, hell no, and slammed the hatch shut from the inside. I know you're all in there, you little shits. Do mummy and daddy know where you are? Do they? I bet they don't. We heard him drop the axe and start to move around with something else. Soon we realized that he had taken out a hammer, and before we knew it, he had started to nail the hatch closed. I threw myself at the hatch, determined to get out, but the moment the hatch was open just a little bit, he reached for the axe. Come on out. It's the better choice, really. He laughed, and we could hear that he was clearly drunk. My other brother, Emil, was pleading with the man to let us go, promising that we'd never return, but his words fell on deaf ears. The rain had started to fall really heavily now. The drunk man with the hammer was cursing and moving around outside, clearly bothered by the bad weather. I might come back and let you out one day, or I might just butcher all three of you. He continued hammering the hatch shut. We were too terrified to do anything, but Sindre told us to keep calm and it would be okay. Surely this guy was just trying to scare us. The dark was compact inside the cellar, and it was cold and damp. After a long while of silence from the man outside, we started wondering if he had left. Sindre decided that we should count to 100 and then try to get out. We counted aloud, and then used our hands to find the hatch. It was definitely nailed shut. Sindre told us to feel the stone walls and search for a loose stone we could use. Eventually, we found one, and it was surprisingly easy to remove from its place. The cellar was old, and had not been tended to for ages, and the rainy climate of the Norwegian coastside had left the wooden hatch doors rather soft with age. The hardest thing was to reach up, since the cellar was built in such a way that it was impossible to get a good forward motion going in order to break the wood. But, fueled by panic and adrenaline, we broke the lower half open. Being lower to the ground, it was softer and easier to tear apart. We started digging the earth with our hands, creating a small opening out. Being the smallest, my brothers pushed me out of the cellar and I could see that the man was indeed gone. My brothers were too big to fit out of the small opening, and Sindre said I would have to find the hammer and get the hatch open. I was absolutely petrified that the man would come back with the axe, and I would have to run, leaving my brothers to die or stay behind and be slaughtered. At eight years old, I had no doubt that would have happened. I got the hammer, but I couldn't get the nails out, so I used the hammer to simply break the hatch into pieces. Soon we were all running for our lives across the garden. When we finally got home, our mum threw a fit over the state of our clothes and demanded to know what we had been up to. Unsure of what to say, we simply said nothing. We never went back there again. Hell, we never even looked that way. The man with the axe? We still have no idea who he was or where he came from. I sometimes wonder if he was a drifter, living in that abandoned house, not wanting noisy kids to disturb the peace. We never told anybody about it, but every year, when Sindre, Emil and I reunite at the family home for Christmas, we like to ask if there's been any news about the old ghost house down the street. Did anyone move in there yet? I won't be using my name, or revealing exactly where I live, in case this comes back to bite me, but I will say this took place in California. Not so long ago now, 
I started using this site that catered to pretty much every fetish you can think of. Some obviously more popular than others. But if you could think of it, there were probably at least a few people in the community who were interested in it too. I came across a lot of these different groups on the site. s and &M, that's a given. Guys who got off to girls stuck in fake quicksand, that one I'll never understand. Adults pretending to be babies, eyeball licking, vor, sex with the elderly, sex with clowns, and of course, the dreaded furries. The one that really tickled my pickle though was leather. I ended up meeting a girl on the site who was into the same thing, and we actually met for coffee. It went well. So well, in fact, that we met up for a few drinks later that week. Her name was Zoe. She looked a little older in real life than in her pictures, but that's usually the case, and she was still very much my type. During the second date, I noticed this table of four guys who kept staring over at the two of us. I mentioned this to Zoe, but she didn't seem to think it was a big deal. They looked a little rough around the edges, but I put it to the back of my mind. Anyway, we both ended up getting a little drunk, and she offered for me to go back to her place. Frankly, I was too far gone at that point, and wouldn't have been able to do anything even if I wanted to. So, to her surprise, I actually declined. She seemed aggravated by the fact I said no. I guess she just thought all guys said yes to an invitation like that. In hindsight, she got a bit too angry about the whole thing, but she cooled off pretty quickly, and I selectively forgot about it. The glory of alcohol. In all honesty, I was surprised that this fetish website had led to me sort of dating a girl. I figured it would all be about hookups and one-night flings. But Zoe and I actually organised a third date. I sent her a message about getting dinner, but she messaged me saying we should skip it and get straight to the drinks. Alright, fine by me. The night started well enough. I arrived late, but Zoe looked particularly happy to see me. You smooth dog, I thought to myself. She was wearing a pair of tight leather pants. Very nice, if I do say so myself. I planned on pacing my alcohol consumption better that night, expecting another invitation from Zoe to head back to her place. I didn't plan on whiskey dicking two times in a row. I order a beer and drink it slowly. Around ten minutes in, I spot those same four guys from last time over in the corner. I'm sure it was them. This was a completely different bar in a different part of town. Could have just been a coincidence, but I didn't like the way they kept throwing the occasional glance our way, just like the time before. Sometimes you just know something isn't right, and this was one of those times. I mentioned it again to Zoe, and we shared a laugh that those guys must be stalking us or something. We chat and flirt for around an hour, when I start to feel a little lightheaded. That's strange. At this point, I've barely drunk anything. This woozy feeling intensifies little by little, and I start to realise something's wrong. I excuse myself, and by the time I make it to the bathroom, the stalls are spinning. I fumble my way inside one of them, and force myself to vomit in the toilet. I knew what had happened. I'd been drugged. But when, and with what? I managed to call the only person I knew would help me without question, my pal Jeff. Slurring my words, I'd tell him the bar name and say I need an evac pronto. I count my lucky stars that I made that call when I did, because a few minutes later, I was so far gone I don't remember a thing. Jeff relayed to me what happened next. When Jeff arrived, I was being carried out of the bar by Zoe and some random guy. Neither appeared concerned. They were more like determined, on a mission. According to Jeff, they led me over to a van 
where a few other guys were waiting, and were preparing to put me in the back of it. When he described the guys to me as best he could, I knew who he was talking about. Those same rough-looking guys who had been staring at Zoe and I the entire evening and the time before. These hadn't been a set of dates, they'd been a set of traps. Zoe and the glancers were in cahoots. That explains her anger on the second meetup. She must have told those guys where she was going to take me, and was planning on leading me into an ambush. This time, she wasn't taking any risks, and wanted to make sure I went along with them. She must have spiked my drink when I went to the bathroom or something. The bitch. Jeff gets out of the vehicle and rushes over, telling them he knows exactly what's going on, and that he's going to call the police. He took their license plate number and pictures of the whole group with his phone. A couple of the guys start to get aggressive towards him, and Zoe's there screaming at him to fuck off, but Jeff manages to keep his cool. When a couple of late night passers-by come along, the group lost their nerve and dumped me in the middle of the road, leaving it to Jeff to scoop me up and get me to a hospital. They took off in the other direction. I woke up in the morning with the worst headache of my life, but other than that, I was going to be fine. I gave the cops as much information as I could about Zoe, but they couldn't find a trace of her on the site, and nothing ever came of it. Knowing Jeff, I'm sure he made it sound more heroic than it really was, but I have to be honest, he really saved my ass that night. I mean, what would have happened to me if he arrived just one or two minutes later? Jeff thinks human trafficking, but I'm not so sure that happens to guys all too often. I guess it's a possibility. Another friend of mine thinks they wanted to make a snuff movie. In theory, it could have been any number of things, especially when you consider they found me through a fetish website. Personally, I don't like to think too much about it. I have a friend called Jane, who's in her early 30s. Around two years ago, she spent a little time on this fetish website, just checking out the scene. Turns out she was much more vanilla than she'd like to admit, and it wasn't really for her. During the few days she browsed the site, she got talking to this guy who we'll call Danny. They exchanged the usual messages, talked about kinks and that sort of stuff. At one point, Danny asked for her shoe size, which didn't really weird her out too much, as this was a fetish website, and lots of guys are into feet and that sort of stuff. But one thing Jane noticed was that Danny was very interested in whether she had any pets or not. Again, not exactly a weird thing to ask, but given the nature of the site, it seemed a little out of the blue. Well, Jane told him that she had a couple of small dogs that she adored, Pomeranians. This seemed to get Danny excited, and he proceeded to ask a plethora of questions, like their names, exact sizes, even asked for pictures. Though she didn't engage with him too much, Danny must have still felt like there was some connection between them, as he asked to meet her in person. Well, needless to say, she turned down the offer, and after that, stopped using the website altogether. It just wasn't for her. A week or so goes by. It's approaching 8pm on a Saturday evening, and poor old Jane is home alone. That was about to change. There was a knocking on her front door, which was odd given the time but she assumed it was one of the other residents that she was really friendly with, Karen from upstairs or something. But when she opened the door, it wasn't Karen from upstairs standing there. 
It was a man she had never seen before in her life. Short but stocky, beady eyes that seemed to look in different directions, and an insincere, sinister smile plastered on his face. In one of his hands, he held a bag. Um, can I help you? She asked. Hey, it's Danny. We chatted online. Do you remember? Holy shit. Danny? Turns out this guy had actually tracked her down in real life. How he managed to find her remains unclear, but Jane must have left some form of online footprints for him to follow. Regardless, he was here now, and the only thing Jane could think to say was, How the hell did you find me? He just ignored the question. May I come in? He asked, already trying to worm his way into the apartment. Feeling very unsafe at this point, Jane instinctively tried to close the door on him. But as she did, he stuck his foot in the door, blocking it from closing. Oh, come on, don't be a bitch about it, he said, now aggressively trying to pull the door open, Jane screaming out and desperately trying to stop him. But he was stronger, and was managing to claw his way inside. Luckily for Jane, the guy who lived in the apartment across the hall was also home that Saturday night, having a couple of beers with a friend. When they opened the door to see what all the commotion was about, they saw Danny trying to force his way into Jane's apartment, with her crying out for help. They both sprung into action, catching Danny off guard and easily overpowering him. They were able to subdue him long enough for the police to arrive. The first thing they noticed was a small plastic cage, which had been left outside of Jane's apartment. It contained a live rabbit, when they finally looked in the bag that Danny had brought along, it became obvious just how close a call this whole incident had been. Inside the bag was a ball gag and tape to stop her from screaming, a pair of handcuffs, a serrated knife, bleach, and a pair of red stilettos. Danny had intended to force his way into Jane's apartment, bind and gag her, and force her to crush the bunny to death with the high heels, and, following that, her two small dogs. That was Danny's real fetish all along. Crush. Watching women in high heels step on animals and killing them. He'd been scoping out the place for the past three days ever since he found out where she lived and since she had no idea what he looked like, she was none the wiser. He never admitted what he planned on doing with Jane after he was satisfied, but the fact that he brought a knife along with him doesn't leave much to the imagination. Thankfully, his plan hadn't been well thought through, so it all came crumbling down around him. It amazes me to think that there are some sick bastards like this in the world, I mean, it's one thing to fantasize about messed up shit, but another to actually try and act on it. Thankfully, Danny's behind bars as we speak, and after hearing this story, I for one have stayed well away from websites like that. I generally try to keep my cases private, but I'm willing to share just this one because it's so noteworthy. I was working a case for this woman a few years back. She was an absolutely gorgeous lady. Youthful, slender, dark eyes and hair. A real catch. Yet despite all of that, she thought that her husband was cheating on her behind her back. I asked her what aroused her suspicions. Had she found lipstick on one of his shirt collars? The smell of another woman's fragrance on his clothes? She said that she had no physical evidence. She just said that her husband had started acting a little off, coming home an hour or two later than usual, seeming a little colder and more distant. She figured he had taken a lover. 
well, the wife had plans to stay at her parents' place that weekend, so what we decided to do was lay a trap to find out for sure. When her husband was at work, she let me into their house to place a few nanny cams and audio collecting devices around the joint. In my country, that's all above board and legal. Makes the job a lot easier than in some other places. Now let me tell you, their house was an absolute palace, and it turns out that the rich one in the relationship was her. Gorgeous and rich. I remember thinking that her husband must be an absolute moron if he was cheating on a broad like this. All the cameras were in place, and the woman leaves for her parents' place, while I monitor the footage from my van outside. A couple of hours pass, and sure enough, in walks the woman's husband. This unremarkable sales type. A real suit. If a guy like this was cheating on a girl like that, he must be a real idiot. Another hour or two go by as I just watch this guy lazing around the house. Surveillance can be the worst. Sure enough though, someone eventually comes to the door. Busted, I think to myself. But it's not a woman. It's another man. Okay, now things were starting to make sense. But it's not what you think. This wasn't a lover's rendezvous. This was a business transaction. As I listen in to the conversation, it starts to become apparent what's going on. The guy at the door was a hitman. The suit wanted his wife dead, presumably so he could inherit her huge fortune. While his wife was away, this bozo was showing the would-be killer the layout of the house to make his job easier. That was their plan, to make it look like a home invasion gone wrong. The husband was going to conveniently be away from home on the night it happened. Had this woman not come to me when she did, she'd have had days, literally days, left to live. Needless to say, I contacted the police immediately. Of course, the two of them denied everything, but I had all the evidence needed to ensure they'd go down for conspiracy to commit murder. That's two life sentences right there, and one life saved. So, there you have it. Those two arseholes are rotting in a cell somewhere. The woman got more for her money than she could have ever imagined, and when people ask what the most interesting case I ever worked was, I get to tell this story and feel like a bit of a hero. All in a day's work as a PI. Well, nah, not really. It's mostly just sitting around and eating biscuits. But still, this was a career highlight. Hopefully that woman chooses more wisely in the future when it comes to her romantic endeavours. If she's listening to this, I'm still available. Hidden away in the rich part of town is my cafe. The luscious interior of the cafe, along with the relaxing jazz music that we play, make this a popular joint for students and housewives with too much free time on their hands. There's even a terrace, which is often filled with people reading books, chatting and drinking coffee. Sometimes something a little stronger. It was November, and a trio of young girls entered the cafe. They'd been allowed to leave school early due to finishing their midterm exams that day. They were complaining about how they went. Well, this is shit. Jesus, I'm gonna have to repeat a year. Oh, come on, you couldn't have done that badly. I've never heard of a student repeating a year at 14. A fresh batch of squabbling ignited, fueled by the stress of exams and the annoying air of confidence one of the girls was giving off. She was obviously the smarter of the bunch. The nattering subsided after ten minutes, and eventually, the girls settled on a new topic of conversation. Namely, what schools they were planning to progress to. In the Japanese schooling system, high schools are commonly split between Chugaku, which is lower secondary, and Kou Kou, 
the upper secondary. What Kou Kou you attend can greatly affect your chances of getting into a good university. Still eavesdropping in on their conversation, the two, well, less gifted students started teasing the smarter one, telling her how the best school in the district, the one she would likely be going to, was haunted. The rumour was a famous one. Apparently, after a student committed suicide at the school, other pupils started to die horrible deaths on the school premises. Witnesses often swore that they saw the dead student at the scene of the crimes. What a load of shit. It wasn't uncommon that people claim places where suicides occurred were haunted. In fact, in Japan, you can find an apartment at a comparatively cheaper price if uh, misfortunes occurred there. Losing interest, I was about to turn away and tend to my duties, when I heard a shout. Now wait just a minute, the voice said. Turning towards its source, I realised it was one of the ladies sitting on the opposite end of the cafe. The woman left her book on the table and walked over to the three young girls. Sitting down with a grunt, she scratched at her long dark hair rigorously. For that brief interval, everything in the cafe seemed to revolve around this little strange woman in a red dress. Then she opened her mouth to speak. I am sick and tired of all of these lies about my old school being haunted. If you three would be so kind as to stop spreading such idiotic rumours, I'd be more than happy to tell you what actually happened there. I couldn't help but listen in to this whole story from behind my counter. I was just as interested in finding out the truth behind the rumours as these three young girls. The story itself wasn't about this quirky woman in the red dress though. It was about another girl that she knew at the school called Akasuki. For the purposes of this video, I'll retell the story I overheard from Akasuki's perspective. I have an older twin sister. I sometimes get asked things like, do you feel pain when your sister gets hurt? Do your parents get confused between the two of you? Stuff like that. People seem to have this idea that twins are connected somehow on a deeper level, more so than regular siblings. But not us two. We didn't hate each other per se, but we didn't really care for one another either. We never argued talked, or interfered with each other's affairs. We might as well have been thin air to each other. Now, my sister was much more able than me when it came to, well, pretty much anything. Athletics, academics. Okay, it wasn't like she was miles ahead of me, but she was always slightly better. Even when the difference was so small, from a young age I was constantly deemed as the less able one. Sometimes even the simpleton. During childhood, my arsehole parents would always say things like, Your sister can already ride her bike, why can't you? I probably learnt it about 20 minutes after her, but this small amount might as well have been the difference between heaven and earth. If I scored 95% on a math test, I never got a pat on my back from the teacher, or even just a reassuring, well done. No. I'd be sitting by myself with my paper, staring at my sister, being championed by the class for getting 98%. But then again, I didn't really envy my sister, and she didn't brag about being better. Like I said, we were pretty much just heir to each other. As implied by my past grades in school, we were both top of the league. There were times where our exam results were first and second in the whole school, so it was only natural that we ended up going to the same high school. That was the best high school in the district. Our relationship didn't change during high school. I actually enjoyed it there, but only for the first semester. Even in a school full of students who scored top grades, there were bullies and rebels. Problem was, these bullies were smart. Whenever they carried out their evil deeds, they'd make sure it wouldn't be found out by their peers or by faculty members. Even when they were found out, they generally got off the hook due to their excellent grades, 
Because obviously, straight A students can't be evil, can they? It started when I came back from the summer break. The bullying, that is. For some reason, they started paying attention to me at school. I don't know what I'd done, but there was nothing that I could do. During lunch, or after school, they'd come to my classroom. Then they'd take me to some inconspicuous location, and punch me, kick me, hit me. Like I said, they were clever. They made sure to avoid bruising my face or arms. There were five bullies in total. One of them was a girl with chestnut-coloured hair, who just watched as three others pummeled me senseless. She just pointed and laughed while giving the other girls orders. She was obviously the leader. There was also one other girl who came along to watch the show. My sister. It didn't make sense to me. My sister hated these types of girls just as much as I did. After ignoring each other for so long, why would she try and break me now? I'd only known the friends I'd made at the school for three months. As soon as they found out I was being attacked by the rogues of the school, they almost immediately stopped hanging out with me, fearful that they'd be targeted simply for associating with me. In the end, I found myself alone at school. The violence continued for months and months. They started getting more creative in the ways they'd hurt and humiliate me. The worst days were when their chestnut-haired leader was in a bad mood. Sometimes I was stripped naked and thrown into a pond. When I fell to my knees out of breath, she'd grab me by the hair and pull me up to my feet. Not yet, Chestnut would say, and the violence would continue. All the while, my sister would be staring at me coldly, without a flicker of emotion on her face. It was as if she was staring at a rat or a cockroach. I couldn't tell what she was thinking. I thought about telling my parents, but they already had plenty to worry about with their work. Besides, they'd almost certainly take the side of their favoured daughter. My sister must have started bullying me in the first place because she knew I wouldn't talk. There was nothing I could do about the situation. If I told my teachers, there was a chance the bullying would just get worse. It was possible the teacher would think I was lying particularly considering that the bullies were perfect students during lessons. There was absolutely nothing, nothing that I could do. Every day when I got home, I'd desperately try and clean the bloodstains off my shirt before my parents came home. I sobbed as I furiously rubbed my shirt. What had I done to deserve this? One time, while I was scrubbing, I heard my sister coming up the stairs. She must have got back from her part-time job early. I pictured her face, cold as ice, staring at me as the bullies beat me over and over again. How could it be that she was enjoying her life at school so much when I was in this state? She was part of the tennis club, had a part-time job, and lots of friends. Why did my life have to be so terrible? We were twins. I ended up hating my sister more than the other bullies, simply because she was enjoying her life so much. The violence just kept on intensifying. One time I nearly died from drowning, because I was just too tired and injured to resist as they dunked my head underwater. I was tired. I could only think of one way out. I began my preparations. I wrote a note with just four words. Mum. Dad. I'm sorry. Slowly, step by step, I walked up the stairs of the school. Nobody was allowed to be there after 9pm, so there were no teachers or other students around. But since I knew the school well, it wasn't difficult to break inside. I finally got to the top of the stairs. There was a metal door leading to the rooftop. I swung it wide open. It was winter at this point, and a cold breeze hit me straight away and chilled me to the bone. There was a full moon, and I could clearly see the whole rooftop area. 
My sister was already there, just as I had asked her to be, waiting with her back to the door. I hadn't expected her to come. She was leaning on the rails of the roof, staring down at the school grounds below. I walked towards her. I wanted to talk to you in private. I figured school would be the best place. Surprisingly, my sister replied straight away. I guess. This was the closest thing we'd had to a conversation for as long as I could remember. I stepped closer to my sister as she continued to talk. So, what did you want to talk about? Without hesitation, I threw myself at her. She had her back to me, and I caught her completely off guard. My sister flew into midair and fell downwards off the roof. Down and out of sight. After seeing the suicide note that I'd placed in my sister's room, nobody suspected foul play. My sister hardly ever spoke to anyone, hardly ever laughed. It seemed perfectly plausible that she had been depressed and taken her own life. That was the beauty of my plan. Maybe with my sister gone, the four other bitches who'd been making my life hell would now lose interest in tormenting me. If that happened, I'd finally be able to get on with my life, go back to being a normal student again. From the time of my sister's death and her funeral, it had already been a few weeks. Feeling nervous, I stepped back into my classroom. All of my classmates ignored me, except for one girl, the leader of the bullies, the girl with chestnut hair. She smiled and winked at me. Hey, are you alright? She asked. I was taken aback by this display of compassion from her. Although my heart was now beating faster than it ever had, I made sure not to show it. I remained expressionless. I'm fine. It's not like I cared about her. Even though I said this, I had been feeling extremely remorseful. Yes, we were like heir to each other, but she had been my twin sister. The bully nodded and smiled again. Hey, that's great. So you're gonna find a part-time job now, I guess. That was strange. Why was she talking about a part-time job all of a sudden? I couldn't hide my surprise, and she laughed when she saw my confusion. <laughs> what? Did you think we'd take pity on you? If you want us to stop, you're gonna have to make a contract, just like your sister did. What the hell was she talking about? The bully looked genuinely surprised that I didn't know what she meant, that my sister had never told me what she had done. She really never told you, huh? <laughs> we were bullying your sister at the start. Had nothing to do with you. We only stopped fucking with her because she agreed to pay us off, and told her we'd find a new victim instead. Oh, I still remember her face when we said we'd picked you. She told me how much I'd have to pay her and her lackeys to stop this torment. Then she patted me on the shoulder, and with another wink said, Good luck from today. We've already found a new target instead of you, provided you pay us on time, that is. Now I understood everything. Why the girls had started to bully me when I hadn't even met them before why my sister was always with them, why my sister had been leaning against the rooftop rails with her back to me, as if she was asking me to push her. Maybe she had been in greater pain than me all along. In that moment, I blanked out. Next thing I remember, I'm being hauled into a police car by two armed cops. I was absolutely covered in blood. The human body is a very fragile thing, it's amazing the damage you can do to somebody with just one pen. And that was the story of Akasuki, as told by the woman in the red dress. I couldn't help but interrupt the story as I brought her another cup of coffee. How did she know all of this? It turned out that the woman in red had been a friend of Akasuki's, at least before she started getting bullied. To avoid unnecessary trouble, she had stopped hanging out with her, but after she found out what had happened, she felt extremely guilty. 
Akasuki had been placed in a psych ward after being deemed mentally unstable. The woman in red paid her a visit and heard the whole story from Akasuki's own mouth. The woman sipped at her coffee. Ever since that incident, all reports of bullying were taken extremely seriously, and anyone found to be a bully was punished severely. But anyway, my whole point is this. It's stupid to say that the school's haunted. With a pale face, one of the young girls pointed out that what had happened there was as good a reason as any for the school to become haunted. I had to agree. This was one of the most gruesome tales I'd ever heard in my life. But to that, the woman simply snapped. If you ask me, what Akasuki did was perfectly natural, given what happened at least. I mean, wouldn't you have done the same in her shoes? When I was 14, my dad and I lived in a small studio apartment on Hollywood Beach in Florida. We didn't have much money, but we treated ourselves to a takeout every other Thursday night from the same Chinese place a few blocks away. They were family run, so the same guy delivered the food every time. We found out later he was the adult son of the woman who owned the restaurant. It was my job every Thursday to answer the door and pay for the food while my dad found something on the TV for us to watch while we ate. And never once did this unassuming Asian guy give me a reason to feel uncomfortable. He was short and tan, with grey hair and glasses. I was friendly, but not talkative. At 14, I was still in that shy stage. We never had a conversation, other than the typical hello and have a nice day. During that time, I was left home alone a lot. Both my dad and I felt that 14 was old enough to spend a few hours home alone in the afternoons after school. I was also very close with the woman who lived next door and her goddaughter, so I would spend a lot of time over there when my dad wasn't home. I walked home from school as well, and it was one school day afternoon, an hour or so after I had gotten home, that the phone rang. This was about 2004, so having a house phone was still pretty common. Ours was set up on the side table in the main room of the studio apartment. I answered it, and for a second, I thought there was going to be no one on the other end, because there was a long pause. Then there was a sort of stammering that I couldn't understand. Then the person said, This is Alan which was barely understandable because of the heavy Asian accent. I say Asian because I'm not sure if it's okay to assume they were Chinese just because they ran a Chinese restaurant. By now, you obviously know that Alan is the Chinese delivery guy. But at this point, at 14 years old, I was confused. Who the hell was Alan? I say something along the lines of, um, what? And he clarifies. Your delivery guy. Chinese delivery. Now I'm even more confused. What does Alan, the delivery guy, want? He goes on. Um, did you, uh, order food? No, we did not. And I tell him so. He's quiet for another second or so. And then he says, Are, uh... Are you home alone? My heart dropped into my stomach. Now I'm pretty sure I know what Alan, the delivery guy, wants. And yes, I was home alone. But I wasn't about to let him know that. My first instinct was to tell him that my dad was home. But his work van wasn't outside, and I realised that Alan had been to our house enough over the last few years to know my dad's van, and if he drove by, he would know that he wasn't home. My uncle is here, I said, but I immediately knew that it was a horrible attempt at a lie and that Alan is going to know that. So I challenge him. Why? He's quiet again for a moment. Then a statement, not a question. You are home alone. 
I'm stunned and have no idea what to say now. As I'm trying to think of something, he says, never mind, and hangs up. I'm so weirded out and scared at this point, that even though part of me thinks I actually scared him out of whatever he had planned, another part of me says to go and lock all the doors. So I do, front and back. By the time I get back to the front room from locking the back door, I look out the front window and see a car parked in the driveway. It's Alan, just sitting in his car. The windows are rolled up and lightly tinted, but I can see him behind the steering wheel, just staring at my front door. Thirty seconds later, the house phone starts ringing again. I don't answer it. Alan stays parked in the driveway for about five more minutes. I stand looking out the window the whole time, thinking to myself that the second he got out of the car, I was going to grab a knife from the kitchen. The house phone starts to ring one last time. I don't answer it. As soon as it stops ringing, I pick it up and dial 911. I was terrified, but not because of Alan. I was afraid my dad was going to be angry at me for calling the police. It's a completely different story, but he and the law have not always been on the same side, and I was raised with a sort of subliminal aversion to the police, and the idea that anything I couldn't handle myself, my dad could handle for me. Alan drove away while I was on the phone to the 911 operator. I was in the middle of telling her that he was calling the house and parked in the driveway, when he just put the car in reverse and sped down the street. The police took a statement from me when they got to my house, and then sent me next door to hang out with my neighbour and her goddaughter. We sat on the front porch and I told her the whole story of what happened, while the officers went down to the restaurant to talk to Alan and contact my dad. In the end, Alan was able to get off with a warning, by telling the officers that there was a confusion and he thought that we had ordered food which his mother confirmed. When asked why he wanted to know why I was home alone, he said he was trying to get an adult on the phone. The police told them that they would have to get someone else to make deliveries to customers in my area from now on, and to make sure that Alan keeps his distance. In all honesty, I think it was my dad's phone call to the restaurant later that really made Alan realise how much he had fucked up, and not the warning from the cops. He was fuming when I told him the story, as I imagine most fathers would be. He called the restaurant and spoke to the woman who owned the place, and then somehow convinced her to put Alan on the phone. What followed was one of the greatest conversations I have ever heard, even if it was only my dad's side that I was hearing. Nothing makes you feel more loved than your dad in macho protection mode. My dad was throwing insults I'd never even heard before and I was in middle school, a kingdom of insult connoisseurs. I knew it was a very serious situation, and I knew that my dad was really angry, but I was in the background, stifling my laughter into a pillow. At one point, my dad asked Alan what the fuck he was thinking, driving over here, to which Alan responded something about being lonely, and my dad said, if I ever catch you on this street again, Alan, if I ever hear that you are near this street, I will make sure that you are lonely for the rest of your life by ripping your fucking dick off and choking you with it. We stopped eating Chinese food after that. I'm a male living in South Korea. My cousin, Nari, used to be an Airbnb hostess here in Seoul. The site's become massive. There's something like 2 million properties listed on it, so no matter where you're travelling to in the world, chances are that there's somebody with a room, or a condo, or even an entire house to rent. During her time hosting, Nari met a whole bunch of colourful characters. There were the sweet older couple that came to stay with her eight times while visiting friends in the city. There was the guy who insisted on bringing his dog with him. This little rat-sized chihuahua that was about half the size of my cats. There were a few people who were high maintenance, and there were a few who were really chilled, and ended up joining us for drinks at the bar down the street. 
I never hosted personally, but I'd help Mary out with her bookings if she had to work late and needed someone to meet her guests. Well, for all the good people, there was Mr. Park. He was this creepy, balding guy that stayed with Nari for a week while he was in town on business. At least, he said that was his reason anyway. I think we were both relieved when he left. I'd met him once, and didn't like the vibe I got off the guy, and there wasn't much she could do to kick him out early or anything, lest he gave her a bad review and dropped her score on the site. After he left, Nari discovered a weird plastic thing he had left in the shower. Turns out, he had left his slimy, fake vagina masturbation aid sitting next to her soap. I took one look and had to explain to her what it was. I remember her picking it up in a plastic bag, like the way people scoop up dog shit on the street. From then on, Nari was pretty picky when it came to who she let stay. One weekend, Nari had to leave for a business trip, so she left me the spare key. She had a booking coming up, a young woman named Sumi, and I was to play host. We'll just call her Sue from here. Sue checked in, got the key from me, and put her suitcase in the spare room. I didn't see any more of her that Friday, or for the rest of the weekend, and I figured she was out enjoying herself. Not too long after that, I could have sworn I saw Mr. Park in our local grocery store. Same balding head, same vibe, but he was at one end of the aisle, and I the other. I got that feeling like I was being watched, but when I looked directly, he was gone. At the time, I shrugged it off, figured it had to be some other balding guy, and I was just projecting my anxiety. Now, the building I live in is fairly old, which means that the walls are pretty thick, and noise tends to only travel in the hallway. If I'm waiting for the elevator, I can occasionally hear someone's TV if it's really loud, but that's about it. That Monday morning, I was woken up far too early by a pounding sound. It was maybe 6 or 6.30 in the morning, and the sun was barely up. At that point, I was pissed. I threw on a housecoat and yanked open the front door without bothering to look in the peephole. I was greeted by two very tense policemen. They asked for my name, and if I knew the young woman who lived across the hall from me pointing to Nari's apartment. Without thinking, I ran across the hall and through the open door, just knowing in my gut that Nari was supposed to be returning that morning, and that something must be wrong if there were police at my door. The cops yelled for me to wait, but I was on autopilot. At first, I thought someone had robbed the place. Her TV was smashed, her couch was ripped apart like it had been mauled by a bear, her photos were buried under broken glass. Her laptop had practically melted into the floor. And then I realized, in some part of my brain, that her TV and laptop wouldn't be here if it was a simple robbery. And that's when I smelled it. Death has a certain stench to it. Sometimes, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, like a hospital corridor, you'll get a whiff of it. What I smelled was a full-on, closed-handed fist slug into the face. In a panic, I couldn't stop myself. I flung open the first bedroom door. Nari's room looked just like the living room, but she wasn't in it. By this time, the officers had caught up with me, and were trying to steer me back out of the unit, but I broke free of their grasp and flung open the spare bedroom door. Inside was what was left of Sue. We get so desensitized to violence on TV that when we're actually confronted with it in real life, it seems almost absurd, like it's totally unreal. She had literally been torn to shreds with a knife. Just from smelling the air alone, I could taste that metallic flavor of blood in the back of my mouth. I showered several times a day for the next week and could not get that taste that smell out of my hair or skin. It turns out that Sue had been there since Friday night. Nari got home a few hours later. 
By that time, the forensics team had already been in and out, and were starting to clean up the scene. I couldn't tell her about what I'd seen. I just remember hugging her. While investigating, the police had found a second set of keys. This meant there was actually a third set of keys to Nari's place, and those keys had prints. Three guesses as to who they traced back to. Mr. Park. Park had made a set of keys while staying at Nari's, and he wasn't here on business as he had claimed. It turns out he lived about 15 minutes outside of the city. Security camera footage showed him coming into the building that Friday night, and him lurking around outside for the past month prior to that, just after his stay. Surprisingly, Park confessed to the murder, said he didn't know that Nari would be out of town, that he hadn't known she had had a guest that weekend. His wife had recently left him and taken the kids with her, and Nari reminded him of a younger version of his wife. Nari and I have both moved buildings since then. I still can't believe that all of this came because of broken trust. By giving a stranger a safe place to stay, by letting him into her home, this person was so twisted that he thought to make a copy of her key. If it had been any other weekend, Nari would have been at home, and what happened to Sue would have happened to her too. I lived in Menifee, California for about over three years. During that time, I went to the local high school, and let me just say that a lot of crazy stuff went down while I attended. One time, a library employee showed up to school very early in the morning and shot herself in her car. The body was discovered during second period. What creeps me out most of all was that I passed by her car while I was walking to school that morning and didn't even notice it. Another time, an undercover cop posing as a student was able to identify kids that were selling narcotics, and shortly after, a huge drug bust ensued. Strangely enough, on the same day that happened while I was walking to school, some guy I knew asked if I wanted to buy pot off him, which I wisely declined. Later on, I saw that same guy get arrested and escorted out of my classroom. If you've ever seen 21 Jump Street, the event itself closely mirrored that. Pretty awesome. However, the one event that was probably the biggest and shook the entire community was the disappearance and death of a local boy named Terry Dwayne Smith Jr. The tragedy happened during the summer after the 2013 school year. I didn't know who the boy was, but I did know his older brother, Skylar. I knew Skylar from school. He was in my first period English class at the time. I didn't talk to him much, even though he sat near me, but on the times that I did say a word to him, he was friendly. He came off as a little bit odd, but I personally didn't think he was really that strange. He had his own group of friends who were really easy to get along with. Something of note that did happen early on in the school year was a confrontation he got in. I remember hearing about how this one guy said something offensive to Skylar, which in turn greatly angered him, and it all erupted into a fight. The kid's front tooth got knocked out. At the time, it seemed funny to everyone else, but it was an indicator of how far Skylar was willing to go when it came to getting agitated. Anyways, on to the main story. After school ended that year, I spent most of the summer just hanging out with my trio of friends. One day, I was in my room doing nothing of interest, so I decided to go on Facebook. While on there, Skylar posted something that appeared on my newsfeed. He said his little brother had gone missing, and was urging his friends to be on the lookout for his whereabouts. I found it pretty unfortunate, but thought the kid would probably be found the same day. Either that day or the next, I forget which, I happened to be watching the news, and the number one topic was the disappearance of a boy named Terry. A picture of him was then put up. On closer examination, I noticed he was the same boy that Skylar had posted about earlier. Apparently, the situation had gotten dire, and the brother's mother, Shauna, had called for a group effort to go and search for the boy. As the days went on, more and more people went out in search of young Terry. I believe Skylar made a few more posts about it, but I could be wrong. 
Eventually, he was made a suspect and was taken into custody by the police because he was the last person to see Terry alive before he went missing. I remember hearing about how a lot of his friends were in denial and disbelief. To them, he could never do such a thing. Since I personally didn't know Skylar that well, I couldn't really pass judgement at the time. While in custody, Skylar changed his story several times about his last encounter with his brother, his main one being that they were both home alone, and he decided to leave and go and hang out with his friends, and that supposedly, Terry had followed him for a while until Skylar told him he couldn't tag along and ordered him to return home. This set up his theory that Terry was probably abducted by someone that night. Finally, after several days of searching, Terry's body was eventually discovered behind the family home, under a tree in a shallow grave. The general consensus at the time was that Skylar did kill his brother for unknown reasons and tried to bury him. Some even thought that the mother was in on it, because she was still in defense of Skylar, who was then charged with the crime. Shauna acted pretty strangely, saying that Terry had autism, and that supposedly at first she didn't let the cops investigate her property. After the corpse was discovered, the huge search party was promptly called off, and a candlelight vigil was held for Terry. In the aftermath, a lot of drama ensued. Terry's father came into town from the other side of the country and claimed that his ex-wife had lied about their son having autism and demanded to take his body back with him to be buried in his local area. He even sued Shauna for a large amount of money. I think it was for child negligence or for emotional distress. The two even appeared and debated on the Dr. Phil show, but nothing came out of that besides what everyone already knew. Since at the time Skylar was a minor, he wasn't charged as an adult. He was found guilty of manslaughter, but was offered a plea deal, the details of which have not been released to the public. Apparently, what actually happened was that the brothers were roughhousing when Terry was accidentally killed. Their mother later suggested something like the boy hitting his head on the corner of a table. In a panic, Skylar tried to bury him in the backyard. What was strange was that knowing what had happened, Skylar still went to Facebook and asked for help in searching for his brother instead of just confessing. Skylar was sentenced to 12 years and will still be in juvenile detention until he's 23. Overall, this was pretty tragic, and it's crazy how one day I was just talking to this guy in class, and the next he's on the news for his own brother's murder. Links to the case can be found in the description below. So, before we start, some background. I have a group of friends, and we've all known each other since kindergarten. There's four of us, me and three more guys. We're all 29 or 30 at the time of writing, and we're 28 or 29 at the time of the event. We're all really close, even though ever since college we meet up very rarely. All of us were in long-lasting and steady relationships, either married or the modern equivalent. That is, except for the main subject in this story, who had just come out of a pretty messy divorce. This friend, Andy, had been having a really rough time of life, as his ex-wife decided to leave him right as his mother was dying of cancer, so it was understandable that we were all a bit worried about him. Well, one of my friends has a pretty nice country house that's far away from civilization, far enough to allow for a nice weekend retreat every once in a while. At the start of this story, we had one of those trips scheduled. The week before, as we were all planning the retreat, Andy decided he wasn't going to go, because he didn't want to be the only one without a significant other for the entire weekend. We all insisted, but we kind of understood his feelings, and since he had another event lined up during that weekend, we left it alone. Still, I wasn't really satisfied with that, as I felt he could really use the change of scenery. So I decided to give him a call on Saturday morning, right before I left for the country house, offer him a ride, and give him one last chance to show up. I called him from the door of my house, and he sounded kind of weird on the phone, like he was sluggish or something. I even joked with him about it. 
It was kind of early, and I assumed I had just woken him up. He didn't laugh or anything, so I figured he was pissed. When I offered to pick him up and give him a ride, he simply replied, Okay. I told him to pack up a change of clothes and meet me in front of his house. Then off we went. It was me, the wife, and him in the car for a nice 45 minute drive. I started noticing things were off just as he got into the car. He was acting really stupid. I have no other way to put it. He didn't get any of the jokes, had trouble understanding simple questions, and kept replying with either a simple yes or no, or with a really slurred, short phrase at the most. At this point, me and the wife had every reason to be worried about him. We started thinking maybe he'd fallen into some weird state of depression, or started doing drugs. He refused to acknowledge that anything was wrong with him, and so we simply drove on, hoping he'd maybe open up later on. So, we all arrived. There was food and drinks and video games. Yes, we get away from civilization to play video games, and since we'd all been friends for over 20 years, there was lots of fun to be had. It quickly became obvious to all of us that Andy wasn't acting right. He wasn't playing any games, wasn't talking at all, and spent most of the time just looking at us or outside. As time went on, I noticed he wasn't eating or drinking anything at all, and one of the guys swears that he kept tabs on Andy and never once saw him go to the bathroom the entire trip. We tried to get him to talk, but he'd just give the exact same response every time. I'm okay. He ended up winning the patience game, and so we all just left him to his own devices. The night went on. He sat on a bench outside, looking at a stretch of woods near the house. We all stayed indoors talking, and then we decided to sleep. Andy said he'd go soon, he just wanted to chill for a bit outside. We all let him be. The next morning, he was sitting outside, in the exact same place we left him, in the exact same position. And that was it. I was completely freaked out, and decided it was time to go back home. We packed our stuff and said our goodbyes. Everyone was really worried about Andy, but we all felt creeped out so we just called it a weekend and left. I drove him home, dropped him off, and went back home myself. Later that night, we ended up all meeting each other again in a restaurant for a birthday get-together of a common friend. I noticed Andy was being himself again, and my other two friends looked really puzzled. I sat down and asked him, Hey man, what the fuck happened yesterday? He replied with something like, yeah, my car broke down, and Peter here had to pick me up in the middle of the night after the bar. Well, that made no sense, and so we all started asking questions and trying to piece everything together. Turns out, he was at the bar with a couple of the other guys at the exact same time he was with us at the country house. When we kept insisting, in a kind of panic, that that was impossible, multiple people showed us pictures of him at said event. Yeah, there were fucking pictures. So we all freaked out, and noticing that we weren't joking, Andy freaked out as well. We confirmed via phone history that his phone in fact got my call that Saturday morning, but he doesn't remember answering it. After this, the talk did continue, but we really couldn't get anywhere, and that was it. As the months passed by, the three of us all got really afraid of Andy, and who he could be. We still have no idea who was with us at the house, and Andy has gotten really sick of hearing about this, to the point of getting really mad when the subject comes up. He says that the most rational explanation is that we all got confused and thought this up. I'm still nervous about that to this day, especially because I dropped him off at his home and saw him enter. Where the fuck did fake Andy go? Did he do anything while we were all asleep? Do any of you guys know anything like this? I asked around, and nothing really fits. I'm not really a believer in the paranormal, but I don't have any other explanation. I felt like writing this to get it out, as the other guys and my wife 
I don't really like talking about it. It gets everyone real nervous. This took place back in the summer of 2014, when I was 25 years old. I live in Germany, and at the time, I had just become interested in BDSM. Basically, the whole whips and chains deal. It's not for everyone, but more people are into it than you'd think. Something like 20% of people fantasize about it. So, if you have four other friends, chances are one of you is a secret sadomasochist. If it isn't you, then you can have some fun speculating about which of your pals it might be. The problem for me at the time was that it's not the easiest thing to experiment with, especially when you're not in an established relationship. I don't think there's any smooth way to bring it up on a date or with girls at the bar, unless it's some sort of sex bar or something like that. That's when I had the bright idea to become a member of a fairly well-known BDSM website, just so I could finally chat about the subject with other like-minded people. And who knows, maybe see where things went from there. It was a surprisingly positive experience right off the bat. Everyone I chatted to was so friendly and welcoming. And I have to tell you, I learned more than a thing or two that doesn't bear repeating here. Like I said, I talked to quite a few people on the site, but one stood out. A redhead with a username that translates into Mistress Honey. She messaged me about two weeks into me becoming a member, saying that I was just her type and that she wanted to get to know me better. Scrolling through her photos, I was pleasantly surprised. Rocking body, pretty face, and from the thing she'd type, kinky as all hell. Jackpot. Over the course of a day or two, Mistress Honey told me that her real name was Yasmin, and that she thought I'd make a perfect subordinate. Someone she could dominate in the bedroom. Well, I don't know about you guys, but to me that sounded pretty good. Just what I was into. But I confessed that I wasn't really experienced with the whole BDSM thing and since she seemed like she'd been around the block a few times, I might not be what she's looking for. She seemed to be really understanding and eager to teach me all she knew. It genuinely was quite surprising how all these sadomasochists were actually really nice and welcoming, at least online. I tried to organize a meetup between the two of us, but she was either never available or had to cancel last minute. She suggested one night that I should go over to her place for a night of fun instead, skip the pleasantries and get straight down to business. In hindsight, it was a stupid idea, but I replied to her message asking for her address. I knew she lived close by, but didn't know exactly where. She sends it over, and it's only a 30 minute drive away. Perfect. Not so far as to be impractical, but far enough that if it goes awkwardly, it's not like I'm going to bump into her in the streets afterwards. I message her back, saying that I'll be at her place in the next hour or so. She replied with a winky face. Hopping in my car and tapping her details into my GPS, I'll admit that I was a little bit nervous about the upcoming encounter. Not because I foresaw trouble or anything, but because, honestly, it had been a while since I'd last been with a woman, and now I was diving headfirst into a world of latex. Still, I guess this was sink or swim time. And besides, she was going to be the dominant one during the course of the evening, which had to be the harder job in practice, right? All I had to do was endure a little whipping, a bit of handcuff burn, and just enjoy the ride. This and other thoughts were swirling in my head as I drove the route highlighted on the machine, until I was nearing my destination. It was a lot more rural than I had first anticipated. I carefully drove down this thin, country road, engulfed by trees so thick they blocked out all of the moonlight, 
my headlights the only thing illuminating my path. You have reached your destination. I pulled up outside this tatty-looking farmhouse. Now, this really wasn't what I was expecting. It was so secluded and abandoned-looking. There was still a fair amount of distance from my vehicle to the house, so still time to pull out. But something compelled me to stay. No prizes for guessing what that thing was. A three-letter word ending in X. A light was on in what I presumed was the bedroom, the top right window of the house. Looking up, I saw that the window blinds were parted ever so slightly, and a pair of female eyes were peering down at me through the slats. Well, she knows I'm here, I figured. Can't turn back now. Checking my phone one last time, she had dropped me a message saying that the door was open and to just come on inside. Like all her messages, it had ended in that winky face. Against my better judgement, I stepped out of the car and approached her front door. Sure enough, it was open, and with a push, I stepped into the small entranceway. It was almost pitch black inside, I could barely see a damn thing. Immediately, I was hit by the faint smell of latex. Whoa, she really was hardcore into this stuff. Not knowing whether it was breaking the roleplay immersion or not, I called out to Yasmin. Silence. Uh, Yasmin? I called out again, a little louder this time. Still, nothing. I fondled the wall in search of a light switch, but couldn't seem to find anything. Was she expecting me to just head to the bedroom right away? I paused, and stood motionless for a moment, listening intently for any signs of movement in the house. From what I could tell, there was a slight moaning coming from upstairs. My mind was running wild with what she might be doing up there. Using the phone in my pocket as a light source, I slowly made my way up the stairs with trepidation, up to where I believed Yasmin was. I reached the top of the stairs. To my left, the hallway was completely black, and could have gone on forever for all I could tell. To my right was the door to Yasmin's bedroom, light seeping out from a crack in the slightly open door. This was definitely where the sounds were coming from, a tad louder now, and strangely distorted. I composed myself let out an excited breath, and walked into the room. As soon as I entered, I knew I had made a massive mistake. By the window, strategically positioned, was a cardboard cutout of a female, made to look as if it was peering out of the window shades. The walls were covered in magazine pages, calendars, and cutouts of scantily clad or naked women, all that was in the room was a massive bed, large straps and chains attached to the posts, a large camera on a tripod aimed at it. Next to it, a table, holding a various selection of tools, ranging from sex toys to knives and other blades. The moaning was coming from a porn movie, playing on a television set. What the actual fuck was this? Certainly not what I'd signed up for. I jumped like someone had lit a candle up my arse and 180'd. As I left the bedroom and made for the stairs, I looked down the world's darkest hallway dead ahead of me, and stopped dead in my tracks. Frozen to the spot, I noticed something I hadn't when I first glanced down there before. The outline of a figure. A male figure, hiding in the darkness, and creeping closer. No, not one. Two. There were two people in the shadows. One standing upright, the other crawling on its knees. 
I could just about make them out now that they were closer to the light seeping out of the bedroom. As I stopped and stared at them, they both froze too. Who the fuck's there? I shouted. A thick male voice replied with one word. Yasmin. I bolted down the stairs and out the front door at lightning speed, praying not to fall on my way to the car, and that there were no other surprises waiting for me outside. In what felt like a heartbeat, I was there and scrambling for my keys. I opened the driver's side door and threw myself in, flicking on the headlights and preparing to make my getaway. My lights hit the house as I turned. In the doorway was a broad man who looked like Buffalo Bill, wearing a dress and holding a hammer. And I fuck you not, next to him was a gimp. A fucking gimp in one of those terrifying masks, charging out towards my vehicle as I reversed out of there, his hands bound behind his back like he was some sort of animal. The other guy, Yasmin, was clearly the master. He stood in the doorway watching, as if he had just released the hounds on me, screaming for the gimp to not let me get away. He rammed into the side of my vehicle, his face up against the window. I could just about make out the whites of his crazed eyes behind the mask, and hear his muffled yells and laughing. He sounded like an absolute maniac. Dear God, I floored it. That gimp in full latex sprinted after me as I drove down the country road, heart beating a thousand times a second. Thankfully, he really was only human, underneath all that skin-tight black clothing, and he soon faded out of view in my mirrors as I put pedal to the metal. I drove home faster than was legal, cracked open a beer to take the edge off, and after some thinking, decided to call the police. They eventually got around to checking the place out. Turns out, the gimp was a living slave. He allowed the other guy to keep him in a cage, feed him scraps, and treat him like crap, all by choice. He had been there for months. All of the footage on the video camera in the bedroom had conveniently been deleted. God knows what those guys were recording. They played dumb to the cops about the whole thing, saying that nobody had been over that night, and that I must be lying. The cops bought their story and let them be. I know for a fact that if I hadn't hightailed it out of there when I did, I would likely have found myself in the gimp's position, only against my will. Perhaps an even worse fate would have befallen me. Who knows? The whole scenario was just so sketchy. Two movies I can no longer watch? The Silence of the Lambs and Pulp Fiction. Damn, love those movies too. In hindsight, this whole thing might sound a little bizarre to most people, maybe even a little comical, but believe me when I tell you that, at the time, it was the scariest thing I'd ever experienced. Before I begin, a little backstory. I'm an American that used to live in China, despite the fact I couldn't speak or understand more than a few words in Mandarin. I was living with my girlfriend out there at the time, and needed to find a way to make some cash. Seeing as my vocabulary was limited to, where's the bathroom, and I'll have another beer please, I figured I was shit out of luck. In the end though, a friend of mine out there managed to bag me a pretty sweet gig. In China, they have a lot of western knockoffs. iPhone clones, designer clothing ripoffs, stolen car designs, etc. They're all made way cheaper, and it usually shows. But this sort of stuff is everywhere. The place where my friend landed me a job was actually a counterfeit version of Disneyland. A small theme park that was catering to the ever-growing middle class in China. It didn't go by the name Disneyland, of course, 
but the whole magical aesthetic had been borrowed, so to speak. In fact, the only real difference was that everything was a lot scruffier and cheaper looking. They had people in circle-eared mouse costumes parading around the park, a guy who dressed up as a duck in a sailor's outfit, and I swear one of the entertainers was literally just Buzz Lightyear. They gave them different names to their American counterparts. For example, Crazy Mouse instead of Mickey Mouse, but you get the point. The whole thing was really shameless, but at that point in time, a job was a job. And my job was to dress up as one of these characters and entertain the kids. The character I was set to play was a tall dog with long, black, floppy ears, a yellow jacket, and a tiny hat. Yup, I was literally bootleg goofy. The kids seemed to know the character well enough, and would always come running up to me, shouting the character's Chinese name. It didn't matter to them that the costume I was wearing was tattered and discoloured. To them, this place was still magical. Thankfully, none of the costumed performers were allowed to talk to the visitors. We could only communicate through gestures. As such, my lack of Chinese wasn't so much of a problem. I was also lucky in a sense that Goofy's known for being quite dumb, so when I didn't react properly to whatever one of the kids said, it didn't seem so out of character. I was working the night shift at the park at the time. There was a special event going on to celebrate the upcoming New Year, and we were staying open a lot later than usual to build up buzz and put on some late night shows and attractions. I was doing my usual thing, namely waddling around the park, boiling to death in my goofy soup prison, and trying to put a smile on all the kids' faces by being stupid. This might sound like an easy job to you guys, and in terms of being mentally challenging, you'd be right. Physically, though, it could get a little rough at times. The sun might have gone down that night, but it was particularly hot. Seriously, it felt like I was six inches from the sun inside that damn suit. I had to take a break. So I made my way to a nearby rec room, one of the few spots in the park where we're authorised to take off our costumes. I get inside, and immediately take off my giant character head. As I'm sitting there, relaxing, another one of my co-workers enters the room. They're in their costume, but immediately I know who it is because of the outfit they're wearing. It's a guy I called Sean. There was only one costume for each character at the park to avoid the kids ever spotting two of the same guy next to each other. That sort of thing ruins the illusion. Sean was hired to play this giant, anthropomorphic orange cat with a big grin plastered on its face. I have no idea who this character was supposed to be. Maybe one of the park's own creations. There he was, just standing in the rec room doorway in all his feline glory. He was one of the few co-workers I had that spoke good English. I looked up at him and said, Hey, how's the night going? He doesn't respond to me. In fact, he doesn't really move at all. He's just standing motionless in the doorway, looking right at me through the eye holes of his costume. You're not hot in there, buddy? You can take your head off. Things go uncomfortably silent. All I can hear are these heavy breaths coming from inside Sean's suit. The kind of breathing you hear from people in a deep rage or something. Sean? You okay in there? I ask him. That's when I notice it. In his gloved hands, he's holding something. It's a hammer. I'm starting to feel a little worried now, nervous about what's going on inside this guy's head. He bursts out into this verbal tirade in Chinese. I could only understand a few of the words, but one of them stood out. Laowai. Foreigner. He's pointing the hammer at me as he's speaking. Whatever he's saying, he's furious. All I'm thinking about is how to defend myself against this guy if he comes at me swinging. Step by step, he's inching closer, waving the hammer about like a fanatic. I can't get past him through the main door. My only other option is the door to the hallway behind me. It leads to another room which has access to the outside. Problem was, half the time the door was locked. If there wasn't another member of staff in there already, I'd be running into a dead end. 
If that was the case, then I'd be screwed. I decided to take my chances. What other choice did I have? I leapt up from my seat and made for the hallway. Sprinting down it, I could hear Sean's footsteps behind me. He was screaming in Chinese, though I couldn't tell you what. All I can tell is that he's hot on my heels. As I reach for the handle to the potentially locked door, I say a small prayer to myself. Please God, let this thing be open. I twist the handle, and the door gives way. There was indeed someone else in the room. I have no idea who he was, and he didn't seem to understand me as I tried to explain in English what was going on. Holding the door closed proved to be pointless. Sean slammed his way into the room, still holding the hammer. I made like a madman for the exit, hoping to lose him in the crowd of the park. I could hear the other employee trying to calm him down in Chinese. At least, that's what I assume he was doing. Thankfully, as I made my way through the park, the guy didn't pursue me any further. I informed my superior, and an investigation began. A few things came to light after that. Firstly, Sean wasn't working at the park that night. He wasn't even in the province. He'd gone back to see his family for New Year celebrations. The suits are left in lockers at the park, so whoever was wearing the costume had somehow got access to staff quarters and very deliberately made a point to target me personally. It also turned out that one of the on-site constructors had a hammer missing from his toolkit. This whole thing had been planned out. The other park worker who tried to calm the attacker down wasn't so successful. He ended up with a broken wrist after struggling with the guy for the hammer. Sadly, nothing ever came of the case. I guess the whole thing just sounded too ridiculous to take seriously. Besides, the cops weren't interested in hunting down some random guy that threatened a Laowai at a theme park. Ultimately, I'll never learn who was behind the mask, or why the hell they tried to threaten me. Nor will I know if they planned to take things further had my co-worker not been in that room. I ended up losing my job for running headless through the park. That didn't matter. I was going to quit anyway. Despite the whole magical facade going on there, I no longer felt welcome. Not being able to find any other work, I ended up breaking things off with my girlfriend and moving back to the States. I'm now married with two young children, and they both keep asking to go to Disneyland. If I see a guy in a goofy suit walking around over there, I'll be sure to shake his giant, gloved hand. Those guys don't get enough credit. Finding love in Japan can be tough these days. The media here says that more and more young people are suffering from Sekusu Shinai Shokogan. That pretty much translates into celibacy syndrome. Basically, no one's getting laid anymore. Half of all young people aren't in a relationship, and they pretty much all plan on staying that way. They just seem to find the whole thing bothersome. A year ago, I considered myself to be in the other half. I was a relatively attractive 24-year-old guy with a decent job. At the risk of sounding cocky, I thought I had a lot going for me, so it frustrated me that I hadn't had a girlfriend since high school. Trust me, that wasn't from lack of trying. There's a number of services in my country designed to fill this romantic void. You can hire yourself a girlfriend who'll walk around holding your hand in public, or you can even go to a cuddle cafe where you can pay a girl to just lay beside you and, like the name suggests, cuddle you. Nintendo even makes virtual girlfriend games. Oh, the wonders of technology. These solutions weren't for me though. I wanted the real deal, a proper relationship. A co-worker of mine, Goro, told me about this speed dating night that was coming up. Said that he was going, and that I should sign up too. Well, it sounded like it could be a fun time. And what did I really have to lose? For those of you who don't know how a speed dating night works, here's a quick rundown. 
a bunch of single men and women turn up to the event. All the women go and sit at a table by themselves, and all of the men get told which one to sit with. Then, a three minute timer starts. In that time, you either have a nice chat, or you sit there in awkward silence. Hopefully not the latter. Once time's up, a bell rings, and you move on to the next girl's table. Once everybody's had a three minute date with all of the other members of the opposite sex, you all mark down on a piece of paper who you'd be interested in seeing again. At the end, some matches are made. Some will get lucky, and some not so much. It was the night of the event, and to be honest, I was feeling pretty confident. I put on my best clothes, sprayed on some cologne, and practiced a few lines in the mirror before setting out. Good guy Goro came by and gave me a ride. Not only were we co-workers, but we had been friends since high school as well. Goro loved chasing after the girls at the clubs and bars, but always had limited success. Unfortunately for Goro, he was on the shorter and chubbier side. Imagine a Japanese Danny DeVito. I hoped the night would go well for him. The speed dating gets underway, and to start with, things are going great. It's about halfway through the night, and there haven't been any uncomfortable silences or anything. There was Akane, the bubbly young Tokyo girl who had moved here for work. Honoka, this hot intelligent chick with a great body. Yumi, this more alternative girl with bleach blonde hair, pale skin, and a really cute smile. And then I got to Kyoko. As I sat down, I thought there was something strangely familiar about her, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. She was pretty average looking, so maybe she just reminded me of someone else I knew. Hey, how's it going? I'm Shin. I know. I'm Kyoko. Nice to meet you. I know. Well, I did have a name tag on, but that was still pretty weird. Other than that, things started well enough, with her doing most of the talking. Well, all of the talking, really. She spoke so fast and incoherently, it made listening to it all almost impossible. One thing did stand out, though. You can check it out when they show it on TV sometime. How's working at Takata, anyway? It must be interesting. Oh my god, have you ever seen New Burrows? They do great seafood there. Wait, what the hell? Takata? How did she know what company I worked for? Had I let that slip somehow? Goro was yet to see this girl, so there's no way he could have mentioned it. I would have asked her if she'd given me time to respond, but she just moved on to more incessant talking. I sat there politely, until the three minute timer released me from that purgatory. I stood up, said my nice to meet yous, and moved on to the next table. I did a lot worse the rest of that evening. Distracted by the fact that that Kyoko girl kept staring at me, like this some blinking, penetrating stare. Once all of the dates were over, I met back up with Goro. Hey bro, did you recognize her? Huh? I didn't know what he was talking about. That girl, Kyoko, from our high school. Man, I can't believe how much she's changed. Kyoko. I honestly couldn't place her in my head. The name rang a bell, sure, but Kyoko is common, and our school was pretty big. She must have really changed. I guess that's why I thought she seemed familiar, though. Huh, mystery solved. Goro continued. Yeah, man, she's really blossomed. She wasn't really into me, though. Pfft, what a jib. So Kyoko knew me from school, huh? Maybe I had her on Facebook and had forgotten all about her. That could explain how she knew where I worked. But if that's the case, why wouldn't she have mentioned knowing me from school? Ah well, she wasn't really my thing anyway. I marked her down as a non-match on my card and forgot all about it, put it down to being one of those weird things, and figured I'd never see her again. Goro might not have been so lucky at the event, but I ended up getting a few matches, and actually went on a few more dates with some of the girls. Of all of them, I got along with Yumi the best. She was the one with dyed blonde hair. Pretty unusual for a Japanese chick, but she could pull it off really well. On our third date, we're eating dinner in a restaurant together. We'd just finished our main course, and were laughing and slightly drunk on sake, when I noticed one of the other diners on a far table from us. 
they were half hiding behind a menu. It was that Kyoko girl, sitting by herself and staring over at us, doing her best to remain unseen. I mentioned it to Yumi, who subtly glanced over to look at her. Well, she confirmed it definitely was the same Kyoko girl from the speed dating night, and made a joke about how she was probably following us around town. It was funny at first, but by the time our desserts came out, she was still just sitting there, totally alone, staring at us from behind her menu. Okay, either she was really indecisive about what she wanted to eat, or she's keeping a watch on us for some reason. I decided to go over and say something to her, but as I stood up to do so, she leapt up and ran out of the restaurant. That was unexpected. Still, the night went on. Yumi came back to my place for some... <clears throat> coffee, and ended up staying the night. I was really starting to fall for this girl. Coffee started becoming a regular occurrence, and it wasn't long before Yumi and I made our relationship official. The whole speed dating thing had actually paid off. No virtual girlfriends for me, thank god. One evening, Goro called me up and asked Yumi and I on a double date sort of thing. Said that one of the girls from the speed dating night was interested in him after all, and had suggested going to see a movie at the cinema. Some corny rom-com. Well, I wanted to help a brother out, so I agreed. When we arrived, Goro was standing there with, you guessed it, Kyoko. Hey bro, check it out. A blast from the past, huh? Goro said, taking me to one side. Bet you never saw this one coming, huh? Me bagging a hot babe like this? I guess Goro thought he'd surprise me with his date being Kyoko. Well, I was certainly surprised. Neither Yumi or I knew what to say. We kinda just stood there, awkwardly. Kyoko smiled at me. Good to see you again, Shin. Yeah, yeah. Hey. She would not take her eyes off me and acted like Yumi and Goro weren't there at all, even when they tried to talk to her. As we shuffled into the theatre, Kyoko made sure that Goro didn't sit next to me, and that she did. This was just too weird. It was clear that Kyoko had set this whole thing up, and got Goro to ask me along with them. I guess little Goro took over the thinking for a while, and he just went along with the plans in hopes of getting laid. During the trailers for the movie, I gave Yumi a nudge, and we both uncomfortably made our getaway before Kyoko could ask any questions. This was just the tip of the iceberg. For the next week, Yumi kept telling me that she had seen Kyoko following her around town, glaring at her with hatred in her eyes. Honestly, I was worried that Yumi might leave me, simply because she was scared of Kyoko's obsession. I suppose that was Kyoko's plan. This whole thing came to a climax on one weekend night. Yumi and I had been out for a few drinks, and came back to my place to spend the night. I put the key in the lock to open the front door to my apartment, but I needn't have bothered. The door just swung open. I'd forgotten to lock the bloody thing before setting out. That was so unlike me. Thankfully, nothing was missing or out of place, and I just cursed my stupidity. We stayed up pretty late that night, fooling around, and before sleeping, Yumi went upstairs to use the bathroom. In the meantime, I laid my head on the pillow to rest my eyes. Then, the sound of footsteps entered the dark bedroom. That was quick, I thought to myself, too tired to open my eyes. I waited for Yumi to hop into bed beside me. But she didn't. She just stood there, breathing heavily. Yumi? What are you doing, baby? I whispered tiredly. Then, in a soft reply. It's Kyogo. My muscles locked up. With a racing heart, I opened my eyes to see a silhouette at the foot of my bed. I couldn't make out many details. Are you awake? Yeah, no fucking shit I am. What the hell are you playing at? How the hell did you get in here? The landlady let me in. I've been waiting for you to get back. She flicked the light switch on the wall behind her, 
and the room lit up. I could see Kyoko now, there in a thin nightgown, like she was ready for bed. What made my stomach churn, though, was the thing in her right hand. It was a knife. What the fuck is this? Get the hell out before I call the cops! Shh. Kyoko continued to take unnecessarily deep breaths, like she was gasping for air or something. Why do you keep ignoring me, Shin? I, I haven't been ignoring you. Just put down the knife and, and tell me what this is all about, huh? It's about this. Why do you always act so weird around me? It's like you never want me around. I don't get it. I show you nothing but love, and get this in return? This girl was living on another planet. It's like she really thought we were in a relationship because of that three-minute date we had, and she thought I was cheating on her or something. This was a total shock to my system, and I was struggling to process what was actually happening. It was like I had woken up in a nightmare. As I sat there on my bed, keeping a close eye on the blade she was flailing around, I heard the toilet upstairs flush. Yumi. Your new girl's very pretty, she said, cradling the knife. Tell me, Shin, is she really so much prettier than me? I was terrified about what Kyoko might do to Yumi given half the chance. I heard my girlfriend's footsteps moving upstairs, and her concerned voice calling out my name. She had clearly heard the commotion. Well, we can change that. Kyoko turned her back to me, and stepped towards the door. This insane bitch was going for Yumi. There was no way in hell I was just going to sit back like a coward. With Kyoko's back to me, I decided to take my chances. I leapt from my bed and charged, slamming the full weight of my body into her. She screamed, I guess not expecting me to attack her. I flew downwards onto Kyoko, the blade in her hand slicing a deep gash into my leg. But I didn't care. The adrenaline masked the pain. I held her pinned down, restraining her hand with the knife as best I could, and screamed for Yumi to get out of the apartment to run to one of the neighbor's places and call the police. When she realized what was happening, she followed my instructions and ran to Old Lady Bankai's place next door. Once I was sure Yumi was safe, I let go of Kyoko. The deep wound in my leg was giving me trouble and starting to make me feel lightheaded. I left Kyoko there, not caring if she was hurt badly or not, and hobbled next door to wait for the police. By the time they showed up, Kyoko had fled. It didn't take them long to track her down, though. She was hardly a master criminal after all. Just a delusional young woman. Before escaping, she had stolen one of my combs and some items of clothing from my wash basket. Little keepsakes, I suppose. As it turns out, Kyoko had been obsessed with me since high school. An obsession that hadn't faltered over the years. Apparently, I'd caught her eye back then and she had been stalking me on and off ever since, monitoring my movements at work and in my spare time, collecting as much information as possible about me. She was so ordinary looking, I never even noticed her. On the night of the speed dating, she decided to take things up a level and make her move. I suppose she thought she might somehow impress me by already knowing where I worked, or that I'd be flattered by the fact that she'd done her research. The fact that I didn't mark her down as someone I'd like to see again didn't deter her. I'm still not sure how she knew I was going to that event. What I do know is this. She had watched me long enough to learn the entrance code to my apartment complex. She had spent the last few weeks convincing my landlady that she was in fact my girlfriend. After gaining her trust, she came by on the night of the incident got my landlady to let her in by pretending she had lost her key, and then hid in my apartment, waiting for me to get back. Kyoko had planned on disfiguring Yumi that night. Perhaps worse. Unbelievably, Kyoko only received a suspended sentence, and was allowed back on the streets immediately after sentencing. Neither Yumi or I could believe it, we did manage to get a restraining order though, which seems to have convinced her to stay away from us. 
we haven't seen or heard from her for the past year. Recently, I checked on Kyoko's social media profiles. Looking through old pictures of her online, I remembered who she was from school. This quiet, mild-mannered girl. It's always the ones you never suspect. She's currently living in Tokyo, and seems to be just as deranged as she was back then. Good luck out there, guys. My brother, cousins, and I used to play a game whenever we had a sleepover. It was simple. We'd stay up and scare the living fuck out of each other. When we were at Erin and Kyle's house, it was the scariest by far. Her house was haunted. That's what everyone said. Even her parents knew it. Don't worry about Mr. Toombs, they'd say. He's harmless. Then they'd laugh and go back to what they were doing. Mr. Toombs was the man who owned the house before Erin's parents. He died all alone, and no one realized he was gone until many months later. Even though the house got gutted and renovated before it went on the market, we had this feeling he had died in the basement right near the furnace. The air there just felt thick and heavy, like old sour breath. We'd have our sleepovers a few times a month, our parents all worked at the same factory. Whenever they had to take third shift, we'd either stay at home and Erin and Kyle would come to our house, or Greg and I would go over to Erin and Kyle's. I never minded all the moving around, until Kyle said we had to play that game. I hated it. Kyle was the oldest, and could be mean if he wanted to. He wasn't a bully. He usually knew when to back off, and genuinely felt bad if he made one of us cry. But he still liked to get his way, and that meant we'd have to play the sleeping game. The first time we played the sleeping game, we were at our house. The four of us were in our sleeping bags in the living room, and Kyle started to tell a really terrifying story about a skinny alien that comes through the window and cuts you up in your bed. Greg, Erin, and I hated the story, but I could tell Erin was especially horrified. She was only six. I kept telling Kyle to take it easy on his sister, but he was relentless. To Erin's credit, she didn't cry, but I think that was the problem. He probably would have stopped if she had. The game went like this. After the story, you weren't allowed to get out of your sleeping bag. No matter how scared you were, you couldn't get up to get water, you couldn't go to the bathroom, and under no circumstances could you run upstairs to get comfort from the grown-ups. If you did, you'd have to get an Indian burn from the rest of the group. The night of the alien story, I couldn't stop looking at the living room windows. Whenever a car went by and cast its lights against the wall, I'd shiver and feel my balls drawing up into my body while goosebumps rose on the back of my neck. Stupid Greg and Kyle were already asleep. Erin, whose sleeping bag was next to mine, was crying to herself. I need to pee, she whispered, and I'm too scared to get up, and I don't want to get an Indian burn when I get back. I looked at Greg and Kyle. They were both completely out. Go ahead. I whispered. I won't tell anyone. Erin gave me a tight-lipped smile and snuck out of her sleeping bag and padded down the hallway. Right around the time when I'd assumed I would hear the bathroom door close, she screamed. It was a shrill, horror-filled explosion from her tiny lungs, and the three of us, now wide awake, vaulted from our sleeping bags in her direction. We got there a couple of seconds before my parents were thundering down the steps. They flipped on the lights. Erin was in the corner of the bathroom, sobbing. Her pajama pants were soaked. Mum picked her up and held her to her chest and asked her what happened. The alien, Erin whimpered, then pointed to the shower curtain. 
Dad opened it. Nothing was there. Oh, it was just a shadow, honey, Dad told her. He glared at us. Come with me, boys, he ordered, and brought us back into the living room while Mum drew a bath for Erin. After a long lecture from my father, we agreed to not tell any more scary stories. Erin eventually came back to her sleeping bag, and with Dad snoring on the couch, we all went to sleep. The next night, of course, brought more stories. They were much tamer, though. Greg told a dumb one about a lady who gets pulled into a grave by a killer. I told an even worse one about some teenager whose baby brother's head came off. Heron actually laughed at that one it was so bad. We got ready to go to sleep, still bound by the agreement that we couldn't get up for any reason until it was morning. At some point, in the middle of the night, Greg shook me awake. Hey, we caught Erin coming back from the bathroom. She was already rubbing her arm in discomfort from the burn her brother gave her. Greg grabbed her other one and twisted, making Erin yelp. I took her arm and just squeezed it a little bit. I felt bad. Months went by, and we played the sleeping game every time we were together. Everyone got caught at least once trying to sneak out. The Indian burns were had by all. Erin, though, got the most. It was obvious she wasn't having any fun. To make matters worse, she looked exhausted on the mornings after we played. I brought it up to Kyle, and he thought about it for a minute and then said we'd do it once a month instead of every time. I didn't argue. We kept our little agreement to ourselves, because we didn't want Erin to think we were treating her like a baby. That night, we were sleeping at their house. They had a beautifully furnished basement with a big screen TV, a ping pong table, and all sorts of other fun stuff. We set up our sleeping bags and played video games until well after 10pm. My aunt came down and said to turn it all off and to get some sleep, so we made like we were getting ready for bed. But when the lights went off, Kyle said it was time to play the sleeping game. I groaned, but he shot me a look and mouthed only one to me. At least he was holding up his end of the bargain. Like we always did, Anyone who needed to get up and pee or get a drink beforehand was allowed to. I went, followed by Kyle, and then Erin. We all came back. In the glow of the flashlight he liked to hold under his chin when he told his stories, Kyle started to talk about a ghost. The ghost. Mr. Toombs. Even Greg looked uncomfortable as he stared at the slatted wooden door, which served as a barrier between the furnished and unfurnished cellar. The furnace was on the other side. Mr. Toombs waits until you're asleep, Kyle whispered, and sucks your breath into his lungs. The longer you sleep, the more he takes away, and if you sleep for too long, you won't have any air left to breathe, and you'll... Be. Dead. My eyes were wide with fear, and Greg just stared at the ground. Kyle too looked like he'd successfully startled himself, especially when the furnace kicked on, and we all jumped. Erin, surprisingly, had actually managed to go to sleep first, despite bawling her eyes out by the end of the story, and making Kyle promise to give her his snacks at lunch, or else she'd tell on him. I snuck her one of the lifesaver candies I'd stashed away to help her feel better. I guess it worked. The rest of us tried to go to sleep. Kyle caught me getting up to pee and gave me a wicked Indian burn, but since he caught me while he was on his way to the bathroom himself, I was able to reciprocate. Hard. He punched me in the arm, and I swatted him in the balls. I won. We tiptoed back into the basement and got in our sleeping bags. It was the worst night's sleep I'd ever had. Each time the furnace kicked on, I knew I'd see Mr. Toombs floating above my sleeping bag, ready to suck the life out of me. 
Well, like always, my aunt came downstairs in the morning to wake us up for school. She started with gentle calls, then hollers, then shouts. Then, since we always ignored her, she stomped down the stairs and threatened to haul us out of the sleeping bags. Let's go, she ordered. Get dressed and go get your breakfast. Erin, if I have to ask you again, I'm gonna flush your goldfish. Erin didn't budge. I swear to God, Erin, Goldine's going down into the sewer with the Ninja Turtles in three, two, one. Nothing. Concern flashed across my aunt's face. Kyle, who'd been sleeping next to her, shook his sister. She didn't respond. My aunt rushed across the room and pulled Erin to her. She hung limply out of the sleeping bag. Everything went really fast for a while. The ambulance came while my aunt and uncle screamed and cried, and Kyle, Greg and I just sat there in stunned silence. My parents arrived soon after. They were also crying. We were all asked if we saw her drink any alcohol or take any medicine. None of us had. I knew Erin had been the last one to use the bathroom before bed, so I mentioned that. Someone went into the bathroom and returned with an empty bottle of sleeping pills that had been in the medicine cabinet. Through her tears, my aunt insisted that the bottle had been empty to begin with, that she'd been saving it so she could remember which kind had worked for her so she could get it again. But there was no other explanation at the time. Erin was dead. There was a funeral. It was terribly sad. But I went on with my life. Everyone did. I learned years later that the toxicology reports had been negative, and Erin's death had been ruled as accidental asphyxiation. They blamed the sleeping bag, and my aunt and uncle sued for millions. When Greg was moving out before his first year at college, I was asked to help him load the van. I didn't want to, but I helped anyway. Some of the heavier things were boxed up in the unfinished part of the cellar, by the furnace. I went down, and tried not to think about poor Erin. When I opened the door and entered the warm furnace room, I remembered that feeling I got the first time I'd been in there. An image of Mr. Toombs decaying next to the furnace flashed in my head. I shivered. But then I noticed the familiar, strange heaviness in the air. I noticed the smell. It was different from the sour odour that had reminded me of the last breath trapped inside a corpse's rotting lungs. This smell was sweet. It was cloying. Like the breath of someone who'd eaten a lime lifesaver. I was 16 years old when this happened, and still at school in Osaka. While there, one particular classmate of mine always caught my attention. A beautiful girl with chocolate-coloured hair and big, bright eyes. Her name was Suzumi. Not only was she really good-looking, but she was kind and smart too. A triple whammy. Needless to say, I had the biggest of crushes on her. Problem was, I could never muster up the courage to ask her out, since there were always a bunch of other guys swooning around her, desperately peacocking for her attention. Now, I wasn't an ugly guy per se, but I wasn't exactly a stud either. So, you can imagine my surprise when she sat beside me one lunchtime, and asked if I wanted to go to the beach with her on the weekend. Like, an actual date. I couldn't believe my luck. There was no way I was gonna say no to that. It was a dream come true when we finally made our relationship official. For a while, everything was great. But as the weeks went by, a different side of her started to rise to the surface. She didn't like me hanging around with my best friend. He was another guy, a gay guy called Jiro. For whatever reason, she thought he had a crush on me. I assured her that wasn't the case at all. Jero and I had been best buds since we were small kids, and we thought of each other like brothers. 
besides that, I wasn't that way inclined in the slightest. I made all of this very clear, and told her how much I loved her, and to stop overanalyzing things. The mid-semester break rolled around, and Suzume started becoming extremely possessive. Jiro's parents were out of the country on an extended holiday, so our whole group of friends used his house as a sort of hangout pad. Occasionally, a girl or two would join us too. Suzumi hated that I went to these events. She was irked by the fact I wouldn't spend every waking moment with her, and couldn't understand why I might want to just chill with my friends occasionally. If the focus wasn't 100% on her, then her sweet and innocent demeanour would melt away, and she'd turn vicious and spiteful. She would even start to get mad when I paid my cat attention instead of her. This was starting to get out of hand, and honestly, Suzumi was starting to become more of a hassle than she was worth. I told Jiro and the guys about it, and they all suggested I cut things off with her. It took a little longer for that to fully sink in. This was my first girlfriend after all, and she was really hot, but nobody should have to put up with this sort of crap. As the days progressed, her neediness turned sinister. She started breaking my things to get her own way, threatened to cut herself if I wanted to see my friends. I'd sometimes even catch her following me around town when we hadn't made plans to see each other, staring at me from afar, and not even coming over to say hi. I'd call out to her, but she'd remain expressionless. Then she'd walk away and disappear into the crowd. It no longer felt like I had a girlfriend, but a stalker. I'd never been in a relationship before, but I knew this wasn't normal behaviour. The final straw came when I caught her slamming my cat's tail in the door. She claimed it was unintentional, but I knew otherwise. I saw the way she eyed the poor thing, before pushing the door as forcefully as she could, probably hoping to do more damage than she did. She was jealous. Jealous of a cat. I ended things right then and there, and told her to get the hell out of my house. There were some tears, but thankfully she left without much resistance. I took my cat to the vets, and he ended up having to have his tail amputated. I had kept Suzumi's craziness a secret from my family for the whole time we dated, and decided to keep things that way. I guess I felt sorry for her. I just said that I had accidentally stepped on the cat's tail. After that, I didn't see Suzumi again for the rest of the break. That didn't stop her from constantly messaging me on social media sites and by text. Her messages were mostly pleas for forgiveness. Others were the complete opposite telling me how she'd make me see the error of my ways, and how I'd regret leaving her. They were the ravings of a lunatic. I ignored each one. The mid-semester break came to an end, and I was sort of nervous about how things would go on the first day back at school. Suzume was a lot more popular than I was. Was she going to start spreading gossip, painting me as the bad guy? I had no idea. Whatever the case, my small group of friends and I knew the truth. That underneath Suzumi's perfect exterior, there was a stone-cold bitch, nuts beyond belief. I sat there in class on that Monday morning, hoping that Jiro would come in before Suzumi. One by one, people started to enter, but two desks remained empty. There was no sign of either Suzumi or Jiro. On top of that... Jiro wasn't responding to my calls or texts. That wasn't like him. Well, perhaps he had an early morning dentist's appointment or something. No. The whole day, Jiro was absent from school, and I couldn't get a hold of him. My suspicion got the better of me, and that evening, I decided to visit his house. When I arrived, his house was surrounded by police tape. Two police cars were outside, and a couple of officers were standing by the front door. I asked them what the hell was going on, but was told that it was a private matter. I told them that the kid who lived inside was a close friend of mine, and demanded an answer. They kept silent, and one of them told me to go home, said that I shouldn't stick around. Well, I was a stubborn young man, 
and so as long as I kept my distance from the property, there wasn't anything they could do to get rid of me. From inside the house, I could hear the occasional female scream, like a wailing sound. I couldn't work out if they were angry, or scared, or heartbroken. Regardless, each time one rang out, my heart sank in my chest. What on earth was going on inside? Had Jiro's parents come home early, and some sort of domestic incident taken place? Had there been an accident? I waited until two cops came out, dragging a chocolate-haired girl by her arms, her hands cuffed. She struggled and screamed before looking up for a means of escape. That's when her eyes met mine. Suzume. Her bright eyes that I had once fallen for had turned dull. They began to water. She dropped her head in shame, avoiding my stare. Without even thinking, I ran up to her, desperate to find out what was going on. I was pushed aside by one of the cops as they forced her into the squad car. I'll be back soon. Don't think about running off with a slut, or she'll die too, she said quietly, as if only I could hear it as if what she had just said was completely normal and every day. Before I could respond, the car door was slammed shut. An ambulance arrived not long after. Two medics rushed inside the house. I remained in the same spot, refusing to move. I wish that I had. Rolled out on a board, pale-faced and with dead eyes, was Jiro. He had been stabbed multiple times in the chest and neck. Another officer inside had been working on saving his life, but it was no use. Suzumi had been holding him hostage in his own home. She got the idea that Jiro was behind our breakup, and not her own crazy actions. Marks on Jiro's body suggested that he had been bound and tortured. When a female friend of his dropped by and saw what was going on, she ran for her life and called the cops. Rather than leave things there and surrender herself to the police, Suzume decided to finish the job. It took them so long to get her out of the house because she was threatening to kill herself too. My biggest regret is not telling people what had happened when she broke my cat's tail. Remorselessly hurting animals is a warning sign of a psychopath. As of right now, Suzume is behind bars. She managed to escape the death penalty because of her age, and the fact that there was only one victim. She'll probably only spend around 15 more years in prison before getting out on parole. If she ever does fulfill her promise, if she ever does come back for me, I'll kill her myself. Two months after my brother and his wife bought a new house, they had to go out of town and needed their cats fed. Their house and my office are both a good drive from my apartment, but only a few minutes from each other. My brother said if I wanted, I could just stay over in the guest room rather than driving among the three places. So I got the keys and instructions and planned to stay there for three nights, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Monday evening was uneventful, until around midnight. I was lying on the living room couch watching Conan, with a cat lying on my chest. I started to drift off to sleep. The next thing I knew, I was standing in pitch black darkness. I completely freaked out, I had no idea where I was. I felt around in the dark, and felt nothing. Finally, I realized there actually was a faint blue light coming from above. I moved towards it, and then understood where I was. I was in the fucking basement. The light was coming through the basement door at the top of the stairs, which leads into the kitchen. Just enough moonlight apparently made it through from a window elsewhere in the kitchen. I bolted up the stairs, turned on the kitchen light, and closed the basement door. 
I was terrified, until I calmed myself down enough to come to the conclusion you probably already came to. I had sleepwalked all the way down the stairs, after opening the basement door, which I know was closed. A couple of things are important to this story. First, the basement. The house was very nice, actually more than they should have been able to afford. The only exception was the basement. I'd only seen the basement once when I'd first got the tour. It was totally unfinished, and was the one major thing they wanted to fix up. All they had down there were boxes and the washer dryer. I had no reason to want to go down there, and had kind of forgotten it even existed. The other point is that sleepwalking is kind of a thing in my family, almost an inside joke. My brother talked in his sleep constantly, and would sleepwalk sometimes. It always scared the hell out of me. The idea of people doing things in their sleep just creeps me out to the core. Still does. My brother knew this and would tease me about it, so it was known in my family that I had this phobia, but as far as I know, I had never, ever sleepwalked until that night. The image kept playing in my mind over and over of me asleep getting up from the couch, walking to the kitchen, opening up the basement door, and shuffling down the stairs in total darkness. Creepy as all hell. Anyway, I saw the TV was still on in the living room, playing the wedding crashes. I watched the rest of the movie, trying to laugh and think of the sleepwalking as a funny story to tell my brother. When I went upstairs to go to sleep in the guest room, I stayed asleep. That was night one. The next morning, in the light of day, it didn't seem that scary. I texted my brother about it and joked around. All day I wasn't bothered one bit, but as I'm walking out of my office to my car, I'm overcome by this sense of dread. All of a sudden, the thought of going to sleep in that house, and maybe sleepwalking again, is scaring the hell out of me. So I had a plan. I stop at the hardware store and pick up one of those rubber door stopper wedges. At the house, I jam this into the crack under the basement door and kick it until it's as far as it can go. I test it out, trying to open the door, and it won't budge. Perfect. Later, I go upstairs and fall asleep. When I wake up, I swear to God I think I'm dreaming. I was standing in darkness again. But this time, I know exactly where I am. The smell is the same. The concrete floor under my feet is the same. I look around for the light from upstairs, and it takes me longer to find it because it's farther away. Last night, I was only a couple of feet from the stairs. This night, it was maybe ten feet. I run up and turn on the kitchen lights. I see the rubber wedge on the floor, a couple of feet away as if it was tossed there. Again, I can't stop picturing myself sleepwalking. Out of the bedroom, down the stairs, trying to open the basement door, bending down and yanking out the wedge, and then, again, slowly down into the darkness. I decided I was turning on the basement lights and they were staying on. I opened the door and flipped the switch to the basement stairway. I saw there was a main switch at the bottom of the stairs. To give you a quick sense of the layout, the staircase splits the basement into two parts. To the right is a small area with the washer dryer, and to the left is the big open area. I walked down and turned on the lights for the whole basement. That's when I noticed something I hadn't when my brother gave me the tour. About 10 to 15 feet away, in the big area, there was a door to what looked like a small closet. This door was closed, but had no doorknob, just an empty hole, so it looked like it would freely swing open. I realized it was very close to where I had just awoken. Then a fucking freaky thought came to me. It was as if each night I was heading to the door and getting a little farther each time before I woke up. 
As soon as that thought popped into my head, I booked it up the stairs again, left the lights on, and closed the door. I went up to the bedroom, but it took me forever to fall asleep. That was night two. The next morning, Wednesday morning, I woke up late for work. I didn't think about the basement at all because I was scrambling to get ready. At work though, I was still curious about what was behind the door, so I texted my brother and asked. He replied, Wait, why were you in the basement? I realized that when I texted him the day before, I never actually told him where I woke up, so I tell him I woke up in the basement, actually twice in a row. After a while, he sends this novel-length text. It was about how the basement is creepy, not to go down there, etc. How they tried putting the litter boxes in the basement, and the cats made a mess in the house because they refused to go down there. How he volunteers to do every chore other than the laundry, just so he doesn't have to go down there. He says all this stuff, and it's surprising to me, because my brother never believed in the paranormal or superstitions, not even when we were kids. I also realize he never answered my question about the door, but I let it go. After work, I get the same feeling of dread as I'm walking to my car. I really don't want to stay there again, and I decide, fuck it, I don't have to. So I go and feed the cats, get my stuff, and drive back to my place. I'm supposed to feed the cats one more time, so I'll stop over in the morning. As I went to sleep at my apartment, I was thinking of all the steps I'd have to take to sleepwalk to the basement again. Find my car parked around the block, drive asleep to my brother's house, etc. But this time, I sleep through the night. That was night three. Thursday morning, I stop at the house as planned. I'm about to leave when I remember that the basement lights are still on. I don't even hesitate to go down there and turn them off. There was something about being there in the morning that, at the time, made it seem fine. When I go down, again, that door without a doorknob catches my eye, and it doesn't even seem scary anymore. So, what the hell, let's see. I walk over to it, and I distinctly remember not feeling spooked at all. That is, until I reach my hand towards the doorknob hole to pull it open. As soon as I do that, and I mean instantly, I feel this electric feeling, like the air before a storm, and I imagine a hand coming through the hole and grabbing mine. It was like zero to sixty, going from no fear to being certain something horrible would happen if I opened the door. It's hard to describe it other than that electric feeling. I booked it up the stairs and out of the house. So, a month later, I meet my brother for happy hour. A few drinks in, we start joking about me sleepwalking and the creepy basement. I say he never answered me about what was behind the door, and he says I don't want to know. Joking at first, but then as I persist, he gets more serious, insisting that I really don't want to know. Finally, he tells me, and I don't believe him. He's my big brother, and he's only bullshitted me a million times in the past. This was his explanation. The previous and first owners of the house had a teen daughter that used the basement as her bedroom. The door was to her closet, where one night she curled up, took some pills, and killed herself. The family was going to remodel the basement, but after tearing it apart, realized they couldn't do it and had to move. That was why only the basement was unfinished and why my brother was able to afford the place. The seller had to disclose a suicide happened in the residence. He said if I didn't believe him, to look up the market values of the identical houses in his track. I know how much they paid for their house, and it was way lower. He and his wife considered themselves rational people, and figured it was a bargain, but they still didn't want to tell anyone. After they moved in, his wife was fine with the basement, but he grew to hate it. 
He apologised for not saying anything to me before I stayed there, but he never thought I'd have any reason to go down there. Now, here's what convinced me. I said, okay, the only thing that makes me kind of believe you is that last morning I was there, and I went over to the closet door. At this point, I see my brother's face change. I continued. When I went over to it, the air felt like... And at that same instant, I say, electricity, and my brother says, electric, at the same exact time. I saw his face and knew he was telling the truth. I've never stepped foot again in that basement, and I haven't sleepwalked since. This has haunted me for a long time. I was about 19 or 20 at the time, and I was living in Savannah, Georgia. I had a crappy fake ID, and I drank a lot. I worked this terrible job as a grunt laborer, the kind where you go to those temp labor agencies like Ablebody or Labor Finders. I'd show up at 4am, work until 5pm, and drink myself to sleep after only taking home maybe $60 for the day. I was supposed to go into work this particular morning, but I decided to skip it. It's a labor agency, they'll just find somebody else. I call my girlfriend and tell her I want to go to Tybee Beach. I had already started drinking. She comes over and we hop in my big ugly van pack up some rods and head to the beach. I decided to have a drink across from the beach at this little bar. This is where the story gets interesting. Shortly after ordering my drink, I get this really weird feeling. I become hyper aware of my surroundings. The door opens and I see this guy walk in out of my peripheral vision. There was a seat between me and my girlfriend, but it was like 9am and the bar was completely empty. He could have sat anywhere else, yet he chooses to sit right between her and I. Then he starts doing this thing with his fingers. The bar top was reflective and he takes his fingers like two little legs and just starts walking with them, skating them on the top of the counter. This isn't something out of the ordinary, but I took notice because when I was in school, I did that all the time. I pretended I had rollerblades on my fingers and that I was skating around my desk. I hated school and was always distracting myself. So I'm watching him do this, and I became kind of mesmerized for some reason. That's when he looks at me, and in this really thick kind of Germanic or Nordic accent, he says, I notice you're a man who pays attention to details. Me too. Now, before I continue, I have to describe this guy. He had this short, spiky hair with bleached tips, kind of like a late 90s style. He had really expensive clothes on. A nice Prada leather jacket, nice designer jeans, Really nice boots. He seemed like a kind of gay guy with really awesome fashion sense and really distinctive taste. I always remember this because I think to myself, some weird homeless crazy guy couldn't afford clothes like that. The other thing that stuck out were his eyes. They were piercing grey. It reminded me of a husky's eyes but his pupils just stayed this disturbing pinpoint size. They were just extremely small, which caused his look to be kind of terrifying. His teeth were normal, right? But not at the same time. I don't know how to explain it. They were sharper than they should be, as if they had been filed slightly. His hands were normal, but his fingernails were slightly long and pointed, as if he deliberately did it. He kept licking his teeth too, as if he were salivating. 
The thing about this guy is that you look at him, and everything seems normal, but off at the same time. So you're left questioning if you're crazy for thinking this. This guy then begins to start talking about the relationship between me and my girlfriend, but really strangely. He's talking about how beautiful she is, and how I should pay her more attention. He admittedly, I was kind of a dick to her. Shortly after he began talking like this, I had this almost knowing feeling come over me. Like, I knew this guy wasn't human. I look at my girlfriend and say, you need to leave. She just kind of looks at me like she knows too. Without a word of protest, she gets up quietly and leaves. Later I learned that she went next door to get a coffee. That's when this guy literally says to me with the utmost confidence, You were supposed to go fishing today. He points at the beach across the street. If you had, I would have drowned you in that ocean. And I shit you not, he fucking hissed at me. Again, for some reason, this overwhelming calm had come over me. I just ask, who are you? He answers back with this crazy, guttural language. It sounded Arabic or Hebrew or something. For some reason, without skipping a beat, and I have no idea why I was so calm to this day, I just ask, say it in a way I can understand. <laughs> uh, you can call me Jimmy C. I jumped off the San Francisco Bridge years ago, and we've been watching you. From there on out, he never referred to himself as me or I, only we. The conversation became something very strange after this. He kept buying me drinks too, specifically whiskey sours. It was like he had an endless supply of money. He smoked Marlboro Ultra Light cigarettes. After I don't know how long, because I lost sense of time, I told him I'm going to leave. I walk next door to get my girlfriend, and she's stone silent. We start driving home, don't say a word. Then I just ask her, do you know what that was? Yeah, that was a demon. This girl had parents that were scientists. She was really analytical completely non-religious, and that was the first thing out of her mouth. Now, I didn't say this part before, because to me, this is the most important aspect of the story, because it's what happened after this that really screwed me up for fucking years. The last thing this Jimmy C guy said to me before I left is this. Look at my car. I look outside and see one of those newer Volkswagen Beetles. It was white. What does the license plate say? I look at the plate and it literally says, Fierce. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, The next time you see me, I'll be driving a black Mercedes and the license plate will say Utopia. Stupid, right? That night, I was still calm. I don't know why. I felt like that guy on office space after his hypnotherapist died right in front of him, and he was weirdly zen. My girlfriend started having terrible nightmares of this guy's head just staring at her in her dreams. Weeks went by, and that's when the encounter started affecting me. I found myself becoming paranoid about that black fucking Mercedes. Every black car I saw, I checked if it was a Mercedes. If it was, I immediately looked at the license plate. I started doing it when I was watching TV or movies as well. Now, I'm gonna fast forward a bit. About 10 years go by. I'm 29, so this is just recently. When I'm alone, 
when I'm drinking. I often think about this encounter. I still look at black Mercedes every time they pass, but I'm not so much anxious anymore, but curious. I remembered that my girlfriend at the time always kept a journal. By now, I'm pretty sure I'm insane. Maybe I was drunk. Maybe I'm not remembering any of this correctly. After years of trying to find news articles of a Jimmy C that committed suicide off the San Francisco Bridge, years of looking at black cars and so on, I felt like I'd grown out of it, so to speak. Yet still, I had to know. So, last year, I tracked down my ex-girlfriend. We ended on bad terms. I find out she's a schoolteacher in Wisconsin, has married a woman, and is actually trying to have a child. I figure she's not going to talk to me, but I send her a Facebook message anyway. I ask her if she could find the journal from that day, because I have to know if her events line up with mine. Sure enough, she had it. It verified everything I remembered, and it contained even more details than I recalled, because she had written it at that coffee shop right after it happened. When I read what she had written literally that day, I knew I wasn't imagining the details wrong, that this actually happened. This is probably the single most frustrating and scary thing that has ever happened to me. I want to imagine it's just a normal, crazy guy, but unless you saw it, felt it, and heard him talk about all of the little details of what you were supposed to do on that day, when only you knew it, you just can't understand the impact of it. It's been ten years, and my only solace, really, is that my ex-girlfriend was there to corroborate. That communication, where I reached out to her, actually caused us to be on good terms again after a decade. It seems to have been something that bothered her just as much as it bothered me. And still, to this day, even though I'm living 10,000 miles away in Southeast Asia, I can't stop thinking about Jimmy C's twisted face. I wonder if he still crawls on my back, and if the fear I feel at night often to where I have to drink myself to sleep or find a one-night stand just to not feel alone, is him, or them, watching me. <laughs>